Hello everybody and welcome to the bonus podcast for episode 454 of Conversation Street and the time has come at last. I've been looking forward to this for a while. It is the Bobbins Awards. Boop boop Bobbins. Hello. Yeah, what? Oh, sorry, I just love it. You can do this all by yourself. It's I, I'm in full on, you know, award presenter, ceremony, cheesy, all ready to go with this. It, and I am Michael, I forgot to say, and I'm here by my lovely co-host. Gemma. Gemma, look how lovely she is, everybody. Gemma, <laughs> yes. for our dear listeners who have not been with us for uh, up to a year, and maybe some people who have been with us longer than a year and might need having explained it to them, what, pray tell, are the Bobbins Awards? The Bobbins Awards are the awards that we do where we make fun of Coronation Street, basically. <laughs> it's, it's basically that, isn't it? It used to be called the Joni Awards and it was named after Sarah Harding's character in Coronation Street, which we also made fun of at the time. Quite a bit. Um, and we have decided, out of respect to Sarah Harding, to rename it this year to the Bobbins Awards, probably permanently because of her sad news about her diagnosis. We don't want to make fun of somebody when they're not very well, but we do want to honour her because, we, uh, like I, I said before in the podcast, her, the legacy of Sarah Harding on Coronation Street is one of just having a crack at something. Just give it a go. It might not always work out, but you still had a try, exactly. didn't you? Exactly. God loves a tryer. Exactly. And I can't, I can't like say I'm mad at, at Sarah Harding for, having, for wanting to be in Coronation Street. If they ask me to be in it, I'd drop everything and drive <laughs> to Manchester now. Um, so yeah, Sarah Harding, we hope that you um, recover and we uh, we really feel for your what, what you're going through. So absolutely, we've renamed absolutely. it to the Bobbins Awards and because Bobbins is just a funny word. Well, the Bobbins has got a bit of a legacy with this as well, hasn't it? Yeah. Because very, very long-term listeners of the podcast will know that back in the very first Conversation Street Awards that we did back in Christmas 2012, we had a category. No, yeah, we had an award, which was the Bobbins Award, yeah, wasn't it? And that was the, yeah, it was the part normal of the normal awards. awards. And we were like, oh, do you know what? It kind of feels bad to, to do an award ceremony about all the great things that happened and then have like a moany bit. So That was the silliest story we used yeah. to call. And we had that for a good five, six years or so, as yeah, well, didn't we? Until eventually you know breaking what? away. There's more mileage in this. There's so many silly things in Coronation Street. Why don't we just do a whole award ceremony just for that so yeah. and so of we course did. we do love coronation street and hopefully everyone will understand that this is all in good fun it's just making it's like i've said this before about coronation street we feel very protective about it as a fan if somebody from if somebody who say was an eastenders fan started telling us about all the bad things that happened in the last year we'd be like shut up you don't know anything but Amongst us fans, we can all agree that there were a bunch of Mardi Mares and Dirty Dogs. So I don't think there's. Not giving I don't think there's anybody that one hundred percent unconditionally loves everything about Coronation Street. Is on the edge of their seat on every episode. Can't decide their favourite character because they love them all equally. I mean, if Coronation Street had a mum. Yeah. That would be the person who would love everything they did. But Coronation Street isn't a person. It's it's a TV show and it therefore has no parents. Quite. Very sad. It's an orphan. Mm. So so nobody's going to stick up for it. No, <laughs> so we're going to be the bullies like. at the orphanage, aren't we? That's, let's get on yeah. with this, shall we? Because we have got, I think, 13 awards to give out oh, this, this a, uh, year. A good number for a for an awards ceremony that's bashing. It is. I hadn't even thought of that before. I think we've... Actually, I think before we used to have... Uh, 14 awards because we did have a, an award in the Jonies called the Bobbins Award which I think we gave for the silliest story or something. What so we just we got, got this time? I think we just got rid of it. I think we've merged oh. a few together. Um, Why don't we just do whatever un we want? Unlike, of course, the other um, awards that we do on Main Conversation Street Awards, this is not a listener voted. Don't worry, you haven't missed out on getting your chance to stick <laughs> your boot into Coronation Street you know in 2020. What? This is all us. Yeah, because... It feels a bit, I mean, it's mean-spirited enough as it is, but then to include, like, a it's public a vote it seems seems a bit harsh. And also, if there's one thing that, that everybody knows about fandom in general is that people are very free to vocalise their negative opinions about everything well, on the internet. That's so, all the internet so, is, so, Yeah, if, they, if there's an opinion that we haven't represented properly in this award show... Do not worry, you will find it on Twitter or Facebook. Or digital spy forums. <laughs> yeah, we should have a digital spy forum. 
forums for like the most objectionable person or something or like the war crimes of Tim Metcalf. Don't forget as well if you want to give us your own nominations or, or winners for any of these categories do send us an email or tweet us or write us on our Facebook group and uh, it could be quite cathartic. To yeah, be honest. honestly, like, that's what I'm hoping it's going to be for us. Don't make yeah. This is supposed to be a bit of fun. Honestly, this is not. This is not like you know the year end review of Coronation Street where we decide yeah, whether call or not we're in gonna, McLeod into our office. We're going to renew the shuffle contract. our papers. <laughs> it's yeah. It's just a bit of fun. It's supposed to be silly. We don't want to get serious about it. It's not going to be like what's the what's the worst contribution Coronation Street made to British culture in 2020? <laughs> no. It's just fun. Should so we... I hope that you enjoy it and let's get started. I hope, yeah, well, on let, let's get category. on with it. This is the Do One New One Award where we this is mean. mark... <laughs> this is all mean. This, this is all mean. Right, and the one thing in that we nice want to say, way. this is not targeted at, at p- real people. This is targeted at... Um, characters and situations yes mostly so this is the award <laughs> mostly for right. the 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 worst new character in coronation street in 2020 and when we did our conversation street awards a, a month or so ago we we remarked that there weren't actually loads of new characters on the show yeah. last year were there and i just want to say one more thing go on then um n- you can be the worst whatever insert category here in one year and then go on to be the best of the next year so i don't want anyone to feel upset or bad about being in these awards this is just silly fun are you worried and that any of the coronation street actors I'm might just be saying, listening to no, this no, no. and i also want to say like i know i i hate this as well when i'm listening to a podcast that's poking fun at something and they spend half an hour excusing themselves and trying to make apologies for what they're about to do i kind of get annoyed now i'm not going to say any more apologies this is just silly fun and the responsibility for um, people being in these categories, I think being in these categories, is on the heads of many people, including the audience, who might take things the wrong way. You think so you're going to be insulted? Shared Just responsibility. Pause now. The shared responsibility here is on everybody, it, on the viewers, on the production staff. <laughs> Everyone shares the blame. Okay, so do, you're not alone. <laughs> And let's talk think, about the worst new characters. So, we've got... Um, we, well, the thing that makes this awards... Another thing that makes this awards different from our other ones is um, we have different number of nominees for each one. Oh, yeah, we, we just don't have a set thing. Chuck however many we, we want And the other thing one. that's different about this is that we go... We haven't. Des- I haven't decided what I think. As we no. talk, we decide as a, as a couple what we're going to... Who is going to get the... Uh, yeah award in each category yeah. so, so so the nominees <laughs> for the do like one seven, new one awards we have got excuses. scott scott emberton who turned up on the street um last spring kind of disappeared a bit around beginning of covid times only to re uh, revisit the rovers round summer cause a massive kerfuffle with johnny and jenny um rob the bistro get arrested never heard of again yeah. Um, then we have also got Laura Nealon, uh, mother of R. Kelly and oh, wife yeah, like of um, Rick Nealon. A bit of a, a bit of a glamour puss and um, also a pretty rubbish mum. It's really I confusing because like, at one point I kind of felt like we were supposed to be sympathetic to her. And then the next minute I'm like, no, actually, she's a horrible cow. Yeah, she, she uh, unbeknownst to her, she is a widow. But... Uh, <laughs> She but could be getting benefits. She's she's also... Um, Think of all the benefits she's missed out on. Can you backdate them? She's a bit of a flighty madam. She doesn't really care about leaving Kel, uh, not, yeah, Kelly in the lurch. I'm, I'm confused because the actress is called Kel, isn't she? Uh, we have got Nikki, Nikki Wheatley, the sex worker who Daniel decided to confide in and dress up and make dress up as um, Bethany. But she was only... Not Bethany, sorry. I'm, I'm, even I'm confusing them. Um, Sinead to try and soothe his aching heart. But she was only doing it because she had a dream, Michael. To go and work in Lytham St Anne's. In a and b Yeah. She needed to raise the capital. It's where she bogged off to late summer. And speaking of summer, um, our fifth nomination is New Summer. Oh. This is this is not a new character, you would think, but he's kind of feeling she might like as well one. Be. Because okay. she has been recast this year um, by Harriet Bibby, I think the actress is called. It's a she bit early, maybe. Herself. It's a little bit early to make a definite decision, but um, the, oh, you, you know, know, you could make some enemies know. here. You really could make some enemies by selecting New Summer because uh, uh, the fact that they've recast her makes me think they have plans for the character and she's going to be in it I'm for a just few going years. By first impressions. Do you want to have an interview with New Summer down the road? Is it really wise to? 
rip into. I'm just saying that new summer is very different to old summer. Okay. And, and please note, I don't have new Todd nor new Adi on here because I actually quite like them. So it's not necessarily the recasting oh, process no. that's made us pick these nominations. But there's one more. There is one more. We have got Daisy. Daisy. Yep. Give me your answer too. No. Are you, uh-uh. Does she drive you crazy? No, no I, I, honestly, of the of the nominees, so we've got Scott, Laura, Nikki, Daisy and New Summer, I think two really stick out to me as like, what the heck? So Not Daisy. I mean, I've, I've put Daisy in there because she, she niggles me a little bit, but I think she's supposed to. Yeah, that's why um, I don't really Sometimes I think she's great and sometimes I think, whoa, ease off a little bit there. It feels like she's quite um, one-dimensional as well at the moment. We we haven't got she's to. Very, um, I I I find her quite convincing. She's a narcissist, and I've known narcissists in my time. Perhaps I am one. So <laughs> I um I think she's well realised. I I don't think that she should she should be our winner here. I think it's a bit too early to tell, and 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 I do kind of like her, and I know that you know this is what her character's like. I, I'm. I'm willing to step back and say no, not yet for her. I mean, who who stands out to you? I think I mean, who you, the two you, that you I, think I would I'm say probably of. you're thinking of Laura and Nikki. No, I mean you're not. Who I didn't think you liked those. Who I don't like Laura, but it's not about who. Well, I guess it, it depends on how you interpret this. Um, I don't think that you should censor a character, not censor, but censor a yeah. character for for being unlikable. I think that unlikable characters are the backbone of Coronation Street and yes. an important part of conflict in plots, which is what drives the drama. So the two characters I really do, don't get on with are New Summer and Nikki. Okay. And I don't get on with New Summer because I think it was an unfortunate timing. Um, I, d- I don't see how they could have done this any differently. It's just a, a, an unfortunate victim of circumstance that the actress wanted to leave who played Summer originally yeah, Matilda. and they needed they needed for some reason they decided that Summer had to be in it and so they cast somebody new and unfortunately they cast somebody who does not look the right age and is so far fairly superfluous to demand I think yeah. I honestly think they should have waited and I don't think it's fair on an actress to be brought into a, a a show with no plot and she hasn't had anything to do no she's had a couple of scenes it it's been that oh what's the what's it going to be like when she meets up with todd yeah, i don't care like i i need something to convince me why they've cast her up mm. when, and I'm, really, I'm sure I'm, it's I'm, coming I'm completely open to them doing that i can understand the reasons behind it i think i've i've not seen anything of her that makes me think that she was a bad choice in any way whatsoever i think she's a great actress i think um, she hasn't been in it enough to establish herself as a new character. People are still watching it going, who's that girl? Oh, it's New oh, Summer. Oh, yes, it's New Summer, yeah. Um, I... it's the, it's, it, the, the age thing does niggle me a little bit, but it's more the fact that they don't seem to have tried to capture anything yeah, that that's made the, thing. the old Summer unique and in this way. It's, it's not even that. It's that they've done that for no particular obvious reason. That's what gets me every time. If I could see that they were going in a certain direction with it and they needed Summer to be X, Y and Z, okay, fine, have at it. Just introducing a new actress who who looks, you know, 10 years older than the last actress. To be fair, Matilda Freeman looked very young for her age. Yeah. But that's, you know, that the reality, you've got to work with what you've got. And, and they've, they've aged her up 10 years, honestly. Um, for no particular reason, changing her personality. Lol. What's the point? Mm. I, 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 agree. I don't think it's really unfair. I think she's been shafted. What, what, what about Nikki then? The reason I picked Nikki is that I found her to be a really inconsistent character. I didn't understand what they were trying to say. I thought that they were trying to be too politically correct. They were worried about giving sex workers a bad name. They didn't really know what to do with her. They wanted somebody who was confident and brash. They... Um, they just... I, I think that there's a big, a big kind of problem there can be in depicting sex workers in a tv show when you're not really sure what you're trying to say about them and you're trying to sit on the fence a little bit it felt a bit like they were like yes empowerment yeah she's earning her own wages but then also she was like a slave to getting five grand it just felt Mm. like one on the one hand they were like oh yeah she's glamorous she's doing it for herself she's not beholden to a man she can do what she likes and on the other hand she was like 
negotiating with Daniel like to get 150 quid off a bloke who's got a baby and a and a dead wife it just felt really sordid when, when, I remember when she first came in and she was revealed I didn't particularly like her in that bar scene but then when I found where they were going with the story and they're having her dress up like Sinead I found that morbidly fascinating and the, I tell you but what as time went on the novelty wore off a little bit and I, I wasn't honestly that sorry to see her go the thing that got to me was that we never really felt very much about what Nikki thought about anything, you know? She cried a few times and she said she wanted to get out of it and she wanted to go to live in St Anne's and she was only doing it for that and she wanted to look after her kid. Mm. Like, we never really got... What did she think about the fact she was wearing a dead woman's clothes? <laughs> Do you know what got I mean? paid for it. She was, she was she really... ka it felt like there was a lot of things about about her situation that Coronation Street was a bit scared to address full on. And if she'd been a, a you know a full time character, we might have seen a bit more of that. She just felt like an enigma, and I... and her whole purpose was laughable. Honestly, she needed five thousand pounds. She never said why she needed it or what it was for. She never explained why she couldn't earn it when she was getting like a hundred and fifty quid off Daniel for an hour long session, mm. and she had to leave him continuously because she had to go have another client. It was just completely inconsistent. I don't think that I felt as strongly against Nikki as you, but I, I didn't particularly feel that I really warm to her once we got to know her a little more not that we did get to know her much i'd probably honestly be more willing to to say new summer out of those two if those are the ones i'm just going to say something for. that's probably a bit controversial and that is that because you're a man you've never been confronted with the idea that sex work is somehow empowering to you nothing about what nikki did or represented felt empowering i don't necessarily agree that sex work is empowering and it felt patronizing to everybody the entire story. So, so would you rather go for her than New Summer? Yeah. Okay, I'm, well, I'm sorry. I'm, it it I, feels I know like that not, you feel more listen, strongly know, than me either way with this. I know that as a feminist, I'm not supposed to say that I found I, I don't find sex work empowering. But I will say, if it was empowering, men would do it. And that's the end of what I'm going to say. You, you're, you've definitely got the strongest opinions on here. I don't particularly mind either way. It's so not that wanna, she was a sex worker. you want to go worker, with Nikki, we will go with it's Nikki. It's not that she was a sex worker. It's that Coronation Street never explained what exactly it was about her that we were, like, there were so many loose ends and I didn't feel like they addressed any particular side of, of what her her story was about. They They had so many, like, loose, yeah, dot, dot, dot. Like, what she think about this? I don't know. Yeah, okay. It felt unfinished and it felt it felt um, cowardly. Really, honestly, it felt like they opened a can of worms and they just threw them on the floor and ran away because <laughs> they were scared of worms. Like, when you're going to have a sex worker story and you don't address the elephant in the room that sex workers don't get, you know, they don't, they don't have any rights, they don't get represented well, they get abused, they get mistreated. They, they kind of acted as though it was a choice in some ways and it wasn't a choice in others. You had, we had a story with Alina last year about her sort of being trafficked and working in a nail salon. Most women who get trafficked don't get to work in nail salons. They, get, they end up being um, prostitutes and, and sex workers and enslaved. And it just felt like a, a bit of a like, you know, oh, Nikki is empowered because she can choose to be a sex worker. Most women don't pick that. It just really felt, it really felt seedy. Well, it, would, it sounds like that's a decision made then. Do one new one, Nikki, and do one she did. Maybe she'll stay away. I'm sorry, everybody. I know it's not politically You said no more apologies. Anything. No well, apologies this episode. We're moving on to our next award, which is the Grey You don't care. You're the one award. that gets judged for all your stupid opinions like I we do. We gave our disclaimers. You let me drink a glass of wine and, and do this. <laughs> You're not even halfway through the glass of wine. You wear everybody <laughs> to the end of this. The Grey Hoodie Award is what we give to our most ineffective villains of Coronation Street, named after... Um, it was Tyler, wasn't it, a few years ago, who had his gang of um, youths, yeah. his, his gang of scallies that Simon so desperately wanted to, to be in. Uh, but they were actually a bit pathetic. So um, we've got a load of nominees for the Grey Hoodie Award, so we need to decide who was the most pathetic villain of all here. We have got Jade. We have got Clayton, both of which didn't make a big splash in 2020, but because um, Jade 
was sort of uh, she left after the first what, month or so, I think. Clayton, we saw a couple of times when Shona went to visit him in prison. Um, Gary as well, who has been a villain, but he's not killed anyone this year. He's just been kind of a bit brooding this year and also maybe committing the cardinal sin of a great Corey villain, regretting what he's done. We've got a twofer, Vanessa and Imogen, so much so that you don't even know who which one's which. And it was uh, Sean in this week's episode, wasn't he? Had to check which one it was that was sitting opposite Gemma really uh, this month. I still don't really know which one's which. But these are the, the nasty mummies who uh, made life hell for she... poor old Gemma at the mums group earlier this year. Who was it that was this time? This Imogen? was Vanessa. Is Vanessa the one that was bullied into being a cow? Uh, yes, Vanessa is the nicer of the... She's the lesser of the two evils. She was the one that was only doing it to go along, just like the Nazis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was only just doing it because everyone said I had to. But um, they, they didn't have... <laughs> yeah, she, it, it's, they, they were both, you know, gave as good as they got at some part in the story. One, I can't remember which one it was that lived in Maudsley Street and uh, they were having like a party that they didn't invite Gemma to and then Bernie goes and crashes it and and stuff so um I, I just i didn't find uh, partly because it was wrapped up in the whole Gemma story i didn't find them particularly great or interesting to watch as villains we have got mick the gangster who made a surprise reappearance in this week's coronation yeah, street I know. Definitely not right I checking him outside his van absolutely the last of him we've got scott again second award second nomination for scott um corey of course oh, I hate corey. and charles the um mustache twisting um, leader of, of Stillwater's retirement facility. So what do you think? The, the grey hoodie is for like the most useless villain. Yes. I want to give it to Mick. I, I, Mick stands out to me <laughs> out of all of Mick these. Mick was like, Mick honestly, oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble again so I'm not even going to go there. Mick's story was ridiculous because it was partly because it was tied into Todd's comeback story which we have gone on record before saying was a massive mistake. <laughs> Fortunately, Gareth Pierce, I think, has risen way out of that since then. But um, him coming back, being terrified of these gangsters that are coming after him. Was it, is he owed the money or something? Mick comes barging into um, number 11, pulls a gun on Eileen, and basically just kind of gets a bit of a telling off from her. Realises, oh, yeah, maybe I... I need to go, and he just kind of leaves with his tail between his legs, doesn't he? It doesn't, and, and it was also mixed up in the whole idea that Todd and him used to be an item, and which it was, was like a, not necessary, not convincing at all, because um, there's no way that he that Todd would have dated Mick. No, and um, then we also had Mick's husband showing up to kind of bring him back. I think I think that was part of his exit as well. Yeah, Do like you, oh, we're we're adopting a child. Like I don't need to know this about you, really. How many times? I know. I understand. I I I, I don't know. I I think Coronation Street was really pleased with themselves when they thought, let's make him gay. Like, let's have a gay gangster. And then they got a bit carried away with, like, fleshing out his backstory. Like, how often do we hear a throwaway villain's, like, whole backstory and about his aspirations for child rearing? I know, and I'm all for what? depth in Coronation Street characters, but this was one of those characters that you just didn't need it. But it's like it, it's like, it was like it was like, um, uh, like a politically correct kind of PSA for gangsters. Like, did you know gangsters can be gay and they can also be parents? Like, okay, I didn't really have an opinion about... And the fact that they, they did him up to look so, you know, yeah, sort of gormless and, 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 and ugly. And, it, he was you know, in he, he, no way an appealing partner for Todd. No, he just didn't, didn't seem his type. And, and, the, and the fact that Eileen of all people, was able to see him off. And I know she has been married to a serial killer, so, you know, he, you develop a bit of a, t a thick skin from that. Not that she didn't have one already. But it was just that once that little storyline was over, it was like, OK, can can we see what Todd's really like now? We've done that. Let's, yeah. let's never see him again. And it almost felt weird seeing him this week um, where he, he actually seemed to be, you know, doing a bit of a better job. And Ray seemed to be a bit intimidated by him, which is more than we could say from anybody in his first appearance. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, it, I hope nobody's listening to this thinking I'm like, oh, I can't believe they made him gay, because that's not at all to do with it. It's to do with the fact that it felt like an improv class of like, yes, yes, let's kind of gone completely out of control. Mm. Like, we don't need to know any of this background about this really boring character. No. We're I mean, looking at the other nominees just quickly. I think looking back on Jade, I did kind of quite like her and I was a bit disappointed when she left so abruptly, but maybe more on that later. Um, 
I mean, she, I think the fact that she, she's a bit, bit grey hoodie because a bit like Mick, she gave up a bit too easily. Clayton, I just don't get on with. And every time they decide to have Shona go back and visit the prison again, it's like, no, just get rid of him. Kill him off or something, please. I'm waiting for Clayton to become relevant again. But he was nasty be because he was, he convinced, we tried to convince Shona that uh, him and David, her and David were rubbish together or, or well, something he, like he that. Well, he took advantage of the fact that she didn't have a, a memory. Yeah. Uh, we had Scott who um he wasn't too bad but i think i think he was a, a real victim of the pandemic and the story being put on ice for a, for a little bit there um and 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 the fact that he was also taken down quite quickly by the police it was a quite a good week of episodes i thought um but he was he was no ray really was he um and then Corey haven't seen very much of him and actually I'm, I'm kind of enjoying seeing him more now to be honest because we there was there was a point where I was I was thinking are we, are we supposed to like Corey are we supposed to forgive him because Asha has but now I know that we're we're supposed to see him as a horrible little scrot I'm, I'm quite enjoying watching him and then Charles again he was okay but um okay he, he gave up too easily once um Ken rumbled his money he also squirreling away nuss fell foul of the the very kind of cliche trope of once his villainy was um apparent to the viewer just a, a cacophony a cacophony of like horrible things became apparent that he had done yeah <laughs> like he as soon as he was a mask it was like and he did this and he did that and he did this it's like if he had been like subtly just... evil the whole time it would have been a bit more yeah and and uh, i mean at the beginning, always from the beginning of the Stillwater story, Norris was clearly unhappy about living there, and he was telling Ken about um, Charles ruling everything, uh, you know, like some kind of uh, dictator, yeah, of Stillwater. But he was coming across as being very nice and charming, all the other old folks there. But yeah, when, once he was exposed at, at that vote, he, kind I think, of he just kind into of like an evil villain, and then he disappeared off, yeah, and then that was bye. it. But. Yeah, okay, well, let, let's do Mick for this. I mean, it seems like we've made, really, made the decision here. Mick would have been okay if there was, like... It was. It felt like there were, like, several things wrong with Mick, and if they'd fixed just one of them, the whole thing would have been okay. Like, they cast him wrong. He he wasn't scary, and we didn't need to know all the information. If if we'd only had one of those, or, like, a couple of those things, mm. it would, maybe I could have forgiven it, but because... I just wasn't convinced from start to finish. He he was he was a victim of of a bad reintroduction story for Todd. I think. Let's go. I would on. have really liked to have had the the actor who played Mick in a role that that wasn't that character. I just felt like he was cast wrong. Yeah, no, no I agree. I agree. Marty Mayer. We, yeah, we have got our two. Um, how do we? Uh, two, these two, are sexist. These are our sexist awards. These are like let's let's condemn people for the gender roles society places upon them. Yeah. So the Mardi Mayor Award is for the well, it's the Mardiest Mayor, isn't it? It's yeah. the 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 moaniest, whingiest, um, Nag- we na- like to, na- naggiest. Yeah, nag. yeah. Let's just condemn um, women. Let's condemn woman. them. Yeah. Oh, that that's that, that walked to the cobbles this year. That we just naggy, want to, moany, you know, slap with a wet fish and say shut up. Yeah. So life's yeah, not so bad. Leanne, you can't really say it to her because her child died. You know, life's not so bad. Leanne, stop moaning. You can't yeah. say that. But you can. This you was could... a woman. This was a woman pushed to the most extreme depths of human misery this year and and didn't you know it from the way she treated everybody else certainly she would not listen to reason can i say that i mean mean, the whole storyline was very much like everybody around her is faced up to the truth and the obvious and and she was like not letting go was she there's certainly a story to be told about uh, somebody fighting against an unfair you know uh, unfair treatment by um, the medical community and this is a story that happens in real life very often that's not the story coronation street is trying to tell because they would be extremely foolish to try to take on the nhs and condemn treatment from the nhs especially during a year that they they didn't know this was going to happen but the pandemic mm. people you know clap for heroes and all that stuff everyone's kind of on the side of the nhs nobody really wants to hear a story about Mal- a medical malpractice on their behalf. It was clear from the offset that that there was no hope for, for, for Ollie. So we weren't watching it from sort of a conflicted perspective of, is she right? Should she be fighting? It was like watching a woman deny reality and, and, and for, trying to, trying to um, 
fight as much as she could against really an unfair world mm. and and biology itself it, it was it was tragic but she spent a lot of time shouting at people <laughs> and moaning at them and yeah um, I, I really did sympathize with her but yeah I, definitely. I, I saw a lot of people and i found and... it really refreshing also to see a woman who was portrayed you know i think really realistically people are like this there are people who are like this who just are their own worst enemy who aren't who who don't who are so confident and comfortable in their relations with other people and god I wish I was like this that they could just be horrible to people and know that they would always have their support and backup that's mm. the thing Leanne really didn't does not know how blessed she was to be surrounded by people who continuously forgive her and understand that she's in a really hard situation so you know simultaneously she was still mildly, wasn't simultaneously she? like tragic yet also blessed a blessed person who else have we got going up against Gemma. This? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gemma she's got five kids to look after only four of which she, are hers <laughs> yeah she she's got a reason to to be mardy but oh, no, didn't she go on this, this year is... particularly during the first half of the year but she had that fight against fresh goes didn't she she moans at chesty moans at bernie it it, it just wears you down really doesn't she um yeah like the yeah, this is the this is the thing about the Mardi Mayor category. It's, it's so irritating because lots of these women have a point, <laughs> and it's like the the power dynamics are such that all they can do is just shout at people <laughs> and not affect any change. And this is the problem. Like Gemma, Gemma's really in a in a hard situation because she is because of her biology just stuck mm. with four kids, well, four of her own babies, and then. And, the, you and know, Joseph, she's the primary caregiver. <laughs> she... And she does have a fairly ineffectual, you know... Useless. Useless boyfriend, doesn't she? Yeah. So, um, we've also got Aggie as a nominee Another for one who's award. got an absolute point, because she spent a lot of the time condemning Grace, who turned out to be a lunatic. Yeah. <laughs> it was Nagy to, uh, Aggie to Nagy, and should she deserve it? We'll see. Um, Alia, I mean... Another again, one, good yeah. Good reason, but she did have a right old go at Jeff, and she wouldn't let go this uh, this year, did, would she? She, she, she was right. Uh, and lots of people thought that this story was the real making of Alia. I don't know whether I would say that, and I, I perfectly happily say <laughs> I'm not much this of an Alia fan. Society condemning women for expressing their emotions, and, and I, and whereas I, men don't. And don't. I must say that that bit on the 60th anniversary episode where Jeff bashed around the head of the mummy <laughs> tent, it was like, go Jeff. Record that. <laughs> um, Carla has just been, you know, we, we've said so much on the podcast how much, you know, that down a. Seem, seemingly irreversibly awful part See, the that thing Carla's is, I don't down. really think of Carla as being Mardi. I just think of her as being pathetic. Yeah, I think you're right. So I, I'm not... I don't really want to give her this, but... Uh, I suppose she's had to go at Peter for his for his boozing, but then that's a good reason. Uh, and also Grace, you 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 um, that she was a late, late entry to this list. Yeah, isn't I she? think a lot of people would put Grace in here. Aggie would definitely be annoyed if we had her and not Grace. Mm. Um, Again, another one where, it, like, in hindsight, when you look back on it, you can see why she was acting like the way she did. Yeah. And, and definitely the conflict between Aggie and Grace is a fascinating study in, like, the power dynamics of a family. I don't know whether there's but any that... But with added weird, crazy... <laughs> crazy. I, I think out of all of these that stand out, I, I, I'd still say Leanne. Yeah, me too. To me. And, and it was complete... And, and this is coming from someone who completely sympathized with yeah. her and, and jane dancer she gave oh, she, she was one of the gave one of the most consistently fantastic performances of coronation street in the past year but i think if i if i'm putting myself in the shoes of any characters that had to go up against her during that story I, I, i'd feel sorry for myself I, in a way i i feel grateful to coronation street for leanne's kind of portrayal in this because it's very tempting to make a character into a martyr and like, you know, a, a sort of saintly sort of put upon character who shoulders all the burdens and never puts a foot wrong. And, you know, it's just a sweet and, and wonderful sponge for everybody else's sad times. Whereas Leanne was like, no, get lost, Nick, get, get bent, Dr. Hospital. I don't agree with anything you say. Like her emotions were were honest and raw and she's and always worn her heart on the sleeve as well I mean, she's, she's been in the show 23 yeah. years on and she's, off she, i've and... always found her to be like this she's always been a really prickly woman and i think that there's a place for prickly women in society and we shouldn't 
you know, I, I kind of like I like the fact that she yeah she wasn't like a vict like a saintly victim. Mm. She she fought the whole way through. It wasn't necessarily the best use of everybody's time, but it was a portrayal of somebody that's very honest. Yeah. Well, that, so and I don't think she should be... I think that Mardi Mare, if anyone's justified, is Leanne. So yeah. she should wear that crown. Let's, like a let's queen. Do it. Leanne, Mardi Mare. <laughs> Mardi no shame. No Mardi shame. Mardiest Mare. Mardiest Mare yeah. of 2020 in Coronation <laughs> Street. The Dirty Dog Award is now. Now, this is uh, for the men of Coronation Street whose brains are lodged firmly in their trousers uh, we've got six nominees for this one as well. Up first, we have David. He's not been too bad, but he did, you know, get a bit too close to Alina that one time this year. And a couple of occasions, there have been a few weeks over the course of the year where he's really struggled to um, stick by Shona, particularly as her personality has changed somewhat in the wake of her brain injury. I just need to add also that because of the way that society judges women and men differently... This is probably the only category where the winner would be proud of getting the award. <laughs> yeah, I think you're because right. Because we think you know, are right. as a society, we're like, yeah, yeah, go, get in there. Get, shag all the birds, I don't care. So I'm not even going to apologise for having this category. Well, I don't think David did actually shag any birds, but he got close there with Alina this year. Um, Corey, who um, oh, hate Corey. filmed his... Um, were they going out at the time? I suppose they must have been. Girlfriend, yeah. Asher, stripping in front of the cameras. And although he without wasn't, her permission. Without her permission. And although he wasn't the one that spread it online, that was Kelly. He Was it Kelly? I think it was Kelly. Yeah, it was. Um, he did certain... He, he was the one that had it on his phone and was leering over it at Amy's party early this year. and si- uh, Early last year. And since then, he has been pestering her for sex. He has been waiting for her to turn 16. Um, so really creepy very weirdo. Very um, He's a future sex case. Yeah. Um, Daniel is up next. Um, I mean, still still because, as I said earlier, Sinead was barely cold and he's... We, he, she, she wasn't even dead by the time he started snogging ben, Bethany in the ginnel last year, was was he? Yeah. But still, I mean, he he carried on. He um, Seeing her for a little bit, he proposed to her thinking that she was uh, Sinead. And then but barely had she left for London that he'd moved on to, to Nikki and very creepily got her to dress up as Sinead and basically tried to replace her. And it, yes, it's it's grief and it's a, it was an unusual portrayal and quite fascinating portrayal of grief as well. But um, I would say that, bit, yeah, a bit, 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 bit creepy. Uh, Adam, who, oh. um, yeah, he, he did the classic Coronation Street move of you got a couple and then they have a little bit of a wobble. He goes off and and finds the first bird he can find. Uh, he can get his hands on and takes her to bed. And then it's like, oh, we were on a break. When he get, eventually gets discovered and he's still feeling the ramifications of that. Well, yeah. Um, we've got Ray. Um, well, say no more. The, the ultimate sex case of Coronation Street the this year in, in Abby's words. Um, and Arthur as well. Who trying to fumble with the tent. I kind of feel bad, but yeah, he did try and get into <laughs> Evelyn's tent during that camping trip. And he still had a wife in the hospital bed I know, as well. what a dirty dog. <laughs> I think Ray's got to win this because... I think he's got to, really, hasn't he? He is, yeah, I mean... It's not that not we even... f- forgive or contone the behaviour of any of the nominees that didn't win the award. There's a lot of predatory behaviour in the, in the dirty dog. Normally it's to do with people having affairs or like sleeping around behind each other's backs but actually mm. there's a lot of really sinister dark yeah, behavior that, <laughs> well it it no. is a bit because he he knew i think he knew deep down inside that evelyn would not have approved of it if she'd known he had a living wife mm. honestly and it, if you don't inform <coughs> somebody of all the reasons why they might not want to consent to what you're up to um I think that's a bit that's yeah. creepy. So I think well, I think it must have been earlier. Yeah, it was at New Year last year that Ray and Abby started inexplicably going out because they, they uh, their eyes met across the crowd of New Year's party, I think. And then he basically used her and blackmailed her, didn't he? he lured her to the hotel in order to try and get a compromising p- uh, photograph of her undressing so that Who's he could... About? Ray, so that yeah, he could yeah, have yeah. Kevin over the barrel and yeah, get, he's the, just been get the garage off of him. Dog. He was exposed in front of... The, the bistro patrons when Abby, I think it was, organised for all of his you know, gagged ex-conquests to, to come and show their faces but not say anything. Um, and 
and well, then obviously he tried to molest Faye. Yeah, obviously that. And then when the, the, when yeah. Abby went to the hotel and she was talking to the the um, new bar staff, who who literally obviously hasn't worked there for very long. I mean, what a great job to get during during lockdown. <laughs> um, she was sort of insinuating that there are many women who work there who have stories to tell about what Ray got up to. Yeah, well, having Debbie come back this year, knowing what Ray's like, and, and we kind of can see that she's not surprised by any of this. Yeah. He's obviously just got a string. And, uh, yeah, and he, and he would try and pass it off as, oh, you know, I, I, well, I'm he, just... Uh, th- this is the issue that world. many people for, for centuries have said. If you get something out of it, you know, if, if there's an advantage, like women, women hold the power. I remember having this conversation with somebody. Oh, well, women hold the power. If they're the ones that are desired and sexy and the objects of desire, they're the ones that have the power over men. No, <laughs> no, that's not the case. And um, Ray has abused this, his position yeah. um, many times. I don't so think we could give it to anyone other than Ray. And this is this is a perfect <laughs> example of when the, convers- uh, the, the, the Bobbins Awards aren't a criticism of the show because they kind of want us to think he's a sex yeah, case. Definitely. And if, if we didn't give it to him this year, then they probably weren't doing a very good job. So yeah. well done, Corey. Yeah, We're giving it to Ray. Your evil villain is the dirtiest dog. The next award that we're going to discuss is the Give Over Award, which is what we uh, award to either... It's usually the, the event or the story or the character or, or something that happens when we watch it and go... No, mm, why? that wouldn't happen, would it? Or that's a bit contrived. Or that Are doesn't make sense. Yeah, Coronation okay. Street, um, and and there's been some great winners of this one, uh, and and sometimes you have yeah great winners of this in the in the past. Okay. Um, and sometimes you know you you have there's to expect these. There's a certain amount of suspension of disbelief that you need to engage in, like. Why do all these characters spend all their times with the all their times with each other when actually you, nobody. Is this involved in everyone else's life? It's, why it's why all the do people? Yeah, why do people it? walk down the road and hear people saying secret things about them, and nobody sees them somehow listening in and earwigging? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to. There's suspect, like I said, suspension of disbelief yeah. is an important part of watching a soap, but sometimes they push it too far. They do. That a character is at position X, they want them to get to position Z, and they're just going to bulldoze through yeah forget about forget, the forget about the let's y just go straight there. let's just get them there to the end of the alphabet so we've got um paradise lost equals hopes in the loft is my first nominee here and this is right back from earlier in the year uh and, and some of the listeners might not remember this but this is when jade well fizz had suspected that jade had kidnapped hope and Jade was actually planning to take Hope away, hadn't she? And she'd packed like a, yeah, a, Hope, a stowaway bag for her. As far as everybody knew, Hope would just run away. Yeah. Um, and, I, and even I'm a little bit vague on the details. Maybe I should look this up more. But I just remember at the time thinking, did, did Fizz find a book or see a book or something? Or was she left a book by, by Jade or something? And it was the book Paradise Lost. And then for some reason... Is Paradise Lost about somebody in the, in the attic? I, I don't remember now. <laughs> this is bad to describe. This is really bad explanation by me, but it was, you know, 12 months ago nearly. Fizz somehow jumped <laughs> to the conclusion. Paradise Lost is like a... Isn't it like a poem from I don't the know. Renaissance? Or... Fizz managed to jump to the conclusion by seeing this book. Ah, Jade must have hope stuffed in her loft somewhere. And I thought that was a little bit unlikely to have happened. So I, at the time I was like, but because I was quite into the story, I didn't mind it as much. But that's my first nominee. Second give over award was um, well, one of the first things that we see, if not the first thing that we saw in 2020, which was Tracy waking up in bed next to Paula, Paula Martin. Um, and we later find out that not only um, it, it's fine and it's not out of character for her, because when she was in prison, she had plenty of lesbian experiences, apparently. Next up, we are um, still on the Hope and Jade story, actually. The very end of that story, I think, deserves a shout out for Give Over because Hope, who had been obsessed with Jade throughout that story, especially after finding that she was her secret sister, turns on her just like that in the course of one episode when Jade made the moves on Tyrone and tried to kiss him. And it didn't take really any convincing or persuasion or anything to make hope sling uh, jade out didn't think that she would do that 
Um, there was also, next nominee is uh, from a bit later on in the year. It's to do with the Gemma storyline when she was doing her vlogging. <laughs> um, and I can't, what was it that she had on her vlog? I don't remember now, but there was, was it a photo or, or a post or something that... Wasn't it a video? Or a video that I she did she did a video and she was like, oh no, it's no good, I'm not going to upload it. And then one of the babies... One of the babies, Bryn. Uploads, uploads it, it somehow it kind of tapping on the keyboard and that uploads the the vlog and then suddenly everybody can see it and it's far too late to take it down and Gemma gets shamed and embarrassed whoever was and... involved in this has never had to upload anything to youtube yeah may maybe dan archibald should have been consulted a little bit more on that one perhaps um we've also got um sticking with the winter household bernie going out to the woods and finding Rick's watch. They, <laughs> they really try to explain this I now know. by making that her secret skill that she's excellent at finding things. And I think, if I remember rightly, the winner of this award last year was Bernie finding um, Gemma's engagement ring out on the moors of Wales. It wasn't a moor, it was a hills. side of a, of a hill um, or a but mountain. fairly unlikely that just by following Gary to the woods and then sticking around a bit with a metal detector with, with Brian, well, they would uncover this. Well, a metal detector is slightly different, this, isn't it? this this watch in the right place that was just perfect for progressing the plot although didn't really it did didn't, it didn't really no yeah next um sally guesses jeff's password so they decide that uh, this is sally and Faye and was tim involved i can't remember whether this is what convinced him but um sally at least is convinced that jeff is hiding something on his laptop at home so she goes in there steals it um a bit of a close call because i think that was when jeff um that found that she was there and Sally maybe pretended she had a book or something but when she gets back home she's trying to break into Jeff's password and classic soap um conundrum ah oh, it's yeah it's password protected and also classic soap um solution to this problem is they somebody who wants to get in is able to guess it I honestly can't think of a time where a soap character or a curry character has tried to guess someone's password and hasn't succeeded within three attempts and this one was um sally guesses jeff's password which was the great magnifico 2 no not course, even any any capital letters or punctuation no marks. capital letters uh, um, and, a, and a random two on the end which i think tim put down to the fact that him and his dad were a duo when they were when they were younger or something i think it's very very unlikely especially as there'd been stories uh, um or scenes earlier that year where wasn't it when Je uh, Jasmine kind of looks over Jeff's shoulder and finds the and, and notices his password or something? So he surely must have changed it since then. I, I don't know, but I, I do hate a, a password cracking scene on soaps. It's a bit. I wish they would just unlikely. just get like drop the drop the hacker act and just literally have the the main way most people have their password stolen is to just have it written down on a bloody bit of paper next to your computer. I think that they should just not have password protected computers and phones on Coronation Street and, and not have, but they, they need it for the, the tension, don't they? Um, we've also got, um, speaking of Jeff, the scene where he managed to somehow get into Elaine's mental hospital room back in uh, December to intimidate her. It was quite an exciting scene, but the fact that he was able to get into Weatherfield General, get to the right place, use this passcode, which he'd got from somebody who helpfully was a friend at the hospital, intimidated her, wasn't seen by CCTV or anything. I was left going, oh, I'll give over on that one. Um, I've got um, everyone accepting Norris as the head of Stillwaters as a possible give over. Ken was the one that won the election, but then he decides, actually, I don't want to live here anymore. Norris can do the job as the chair of the whatever it was committee. And everyone's like, oh, OK, yeah, Norris, the yeah. person who's been criticising our home for the past, you know, month or however long he's been living here. He's perfect for running um for Even running though the place. we have a democratic process in place, we completely accept an arbitrary selection of a person based on just nothing. Yeah. Um, and finally, maybe this isn't quite so much a give over, but this is the best category for it to go in, I think. Maybe the give over is, I can't believe that this went on for so long. Um, the, the arguments between Brian and Kathy about what these flowers that Tyrone brought into the, cafe, uh, the cabin one day, dog roses, as Brian said, or cornflowers, which Kathy insisted. Um, Don't that, get me started. That on made this. up a good ten minutes of a of a hour long episode of Coronation. It also Street, made up a good half I hour get back. of a podcast because I went on and on and on about this. Well, how you you, you convinced it didn't even, look like either? I'm not even going to go there. In a world where 
you can look on the internet and search for a picture of a dog rose and go, oh, they're pink with yellow bits in the middle and Tyrone has got these kind of puffy blue flowers and that's what cornflowers look like. I don't know no, how I this... Don't. A bit like that. I, I have looked at cornflowers again on the internet this afternoon. Don't look, forget it. We, we, don't even go into this because they weren't either. Yes, um, but... It was very, very silly, and it, it, that really shouldn't have gone past the initial, you know, brainstorming stages. It's difficult to know sometimes when you're watching something and you're like, this isn't funny. Like, do other people think this is funny? I don't know. I can give things a pass if other th people think it's funny, but I didn't see anybody saying, God, I'm glad they had that scene. It was hilarious. I'm sure some people loved it, but for me, it um, felt like a waste of time. It, it felt like a waste of time, and, and also more fuel for the fire of. Oh, Brian and Kathy, oh, they're not. They're just generally not as funny as Corey think they are. And, and we've got some real, you know, quality actors here. I, I can't say that I've seen um, uh, uh, Peter Gunn in, in, in anything oh, else yeah, other than this. What? But Melanie Hill is a fantastic dramatic actress. Oh, yeah. And whenever I see her in stories like this, I just go, no, she can do more than Melanie that. Corey, please let like her. Amazing actress. But the other thing that's a tragedy about this is that Peter Gunn is far more hilarious than um, his character. Mm. Peter Gunn is just a naturally funny person. Every time I see You're him right, in, actually. in anything, it's like, can you just got, get him to write the script for Brian? Because you don't seem to know what's funny and what isn't. Oh, he was on the Zoom quiz that I did last yes. June, wasn't he? He was hilarious. He was great. And he was also, he's also appeared on um, the uh, the podcast that Jack... Um, oh, yeah, yeah that's right. He's in the Sofa Colson Cinema Club, did. hasn't he? Yeah. Um, he's just seems really witty and naturally funny mm. and he's landed with this character who's just a buffoonish, buffoonish idiot. I don't think that that can get the Give Over Award because I I don't think it's... For Give Over, really, it's like, no, that, that wouldn't it happen. And, and the way limits. that the way that Brian and Kathy are at the moment, it's like, no, that probably would happen. Yeah, I just don't really enjoy it. it. Um, I, I'm kind have... of going towards the Tracy and Paula here. I think that out of... That that's kind of the, the, the character move that goes so against what has been well established for that character. There's this man eater who just for the shock value, literally, on New Year's Day, wakes up in Paula's bed just so she can have a bit of a Barney with Amy for a bit, mini falling out with Steve, and then it's, you know, a month, two months later it's all over with. Um, and the fact that we're supposed to buy into the fact that she's always, you know, had lesbian leanings when she really has shown no evidence of that at all. Um, I think it. I think it's patronising to everybody to to change a character's um, sexuality for a scene, and then kind of try to deflect criticism by hiding behind the idea that if you ever question a character's sexuality it makes you in some way bigoted or homophobic mm. honestly to me it did not fit for tracy and it was it really just seemed to be done for cheap shock value and it it was it was it was very ridiculous what, what about some of the other nominees i mean is there anything that stands up against that i mean i, I suppose gonna... things like the password are just like yeah that's standard soap as stupid as it is but what do you think I was just going to pick the Paradise Lost thing, which was like, just random, random reaching. It it was, it really was. And when we watched it, I remember just going, eh? but I think for the one that I feel strongest about is, is that Tracy one, to be honest. Well, what, what would you say then to people that said that that's a homophobic thing for you to say? Tracy has shown no, you know, no leanings towards that before in the past. It was, it was... I think it was clearly done to titivate and to cause unnecessary drama between her and Amy and Steve. And also the fact that it's been, you know, dropped after a couple of if months meant had... that it was just done for a you know, quick and cheap soap cover magazine. It it felt salacious and disrespectful to the the real experiences of lesbian and bisexual people. And that's all I'll say. So should we, should we give it to that one? Yeah. Right. Give over. Tracy would not end up in bed with Paula Martin. Gemma. Gemma. Oh, I forgot your name then. <laughs> what? Our next award, please. I'll, I'll let you do a bit of announcing because I think I've kind of taken over a bit with some of these. This is the 
Can do something award. This is yeah. This is the award for uh, okay. This is this isn't necessarily a criticism of the characters in any way. This is the this is the award for you, you guys haven't really done much. This is well, this... and we kind of like to see you do something in twenty twenty one. Slightly unfair, considering that there's a pandemic going on and there's a limit to the amount of time certain people can spend on set. But I know. when did we ever let fairness get in the way of us criticising something? Well, exactly, exactly. So and there are definitely some characters here that are victims of of COVID. Not that doesn't make that makes it sound like they've got it. They are victims of the, the, the pandemic and the situation, and they, and they they couldn't spend as much time in work at Coronation Street as we want them to be. But yeah, even so, we miss, also people we might miss them on screen. Who have not been in it? There, there are just some people that haven't been in it, and maybe we think they should, or maybe, maybe we're glad we that they're think. not in it. Number, I mean, our, our first one here is Moira, who made a grand total of one appearance in 2020 in a classic scene where Evelyn comes to the medical centre screaming out for Dr. Gaddas. Um, but since then, we've seen neither Hyde nor glorious auburn hair of her. And um, I, I, it feels like we may not be seeing any more of her, but um, I, I really would like her to do something. We've got Izzy, who was in six episodes last year. Um, Rita, only 14. Obviously, um, Barbara Knox had to hide herself away for quite a long period of the year. But, um, yeah, only 14 for, for a great read. Audrey was in 19 episodes. There's a couple of surprising ones. I mean, Ardy and Asher, just, I mean, when I look back at the year and I think of what are some of the, you know, the standouts been, that they would be up there for me. Ardy for her, a very re- a very successful recasting and, and Asha for her continued um, blossoming as a character, which started in 2019. But um, they only made 22 and 30 appearances last year, respectively. Um, we didn't see much of Beth or Seb or Alina last year. Um, James, Kirk, even old Officer Craigie only made 47 appearances in uh, 2020. And um, there's also George Shuttleworth, who was... Um, it it felt like his um his arrival on the street was heralded quite a way before he made his first appearance um especially you know being the the son of the the great archie shuttleworth but it feels like since he's arrived on the street they've not really had much to do with him we haven't seen very much of him he's kind of been hanging around Mary and Eileen for a bit, and, and he was kind of helpful in Todd's appearance story, but that's it. So um, why wasn't he in the like do one new one? Because I feel a bit like what? Why are you here? He like, could I have really been. Like I really like the idea of him, but I can't see why he's there. No, it's a very it's like very very slow start. I quite this, like him. I think it reminds me of like you have a steak, and then someone brings you a pizza, and you're like, well, that's nice. But why is it here now? I don't need it now. Do something with it. Mm. Bring it to me when I need something to eat. Yeah. I mean, he's it, it, a popular actor coming fresh from Benidorm. Not not that we watched that. The show, not the place. Yes. Um, but I, I, I don't want to give this award to him, although I would like him to do something. I mean, it, it's not like he's been neglected like some of these other characters yeah. have been because they, I'm just thinking, surely, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, surely they must have some plans for him. Well, this is like what I said about New Summer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I am not going to pick somebody for me that I think is possibly in this list because of technical production COVID reasons. I don't think that's fair. Um it, you know, it's a tribute to these characters, some of them, that they're in this list because we want more of them, but we can't have them for obvious reasons. I'm just going to pick somebody who I think... I don't... I, I just like... They're just superfluous. And unfortunately, I'm picking James Bailey. But are you? But I thought the Can Do Something was somebody that we, we want them to see more of. So if they're superfluous no. to me, that would mean that we don't really I'm changing care the name of the category. Can you I haven't done think, much and you'd and, I think and keep I think on it's inappropriate to, to call people out for not doing something during a pandemic. So I'm gonna so is this, is I'm this... picking James because I'm like, what are you doing? What are you here for? You came in, you were like on it felt like he was the Bailey that we were most supposed to be invested in because he had the most plot. And then what has he done since and why should we care? Yeah, I mean he went out with Bethany for a bit as a as a cover for his sexuality. He um, 
he came out to Ed earlier this year, didn't he? Which was kind of a powerful story for him, but then it was just over and done with in a heartbeat, it felt. He stood up to that guy in the changing rooms. He's had lots of challenges, but I think there's more to, to, to him. And I've said this in a previous podcast, and I've said it in a previous podcast, I said it in a previous podcast, but nothing about his story tells him who he... Who, tells you who he is as a person and I want to know more about James not the struggles that James faces because he's a gay footballer that, I think that's I think that's and fair honestly, enough I it, think, it's difficult to I think the this, story yeah. of of being a gay footballer would have been a stronger more compelling story had we been emotionally invested in James as a person rather than as sort of a figurehead for a a problem in society in general mm. and that's an issue that we are gonna we come up against with the baileys over and over where they're figureheads for a for a, um, a larger problem that society faces and they specifically as a group face mm. and not who are the baileys i mean to be honest a good three quarters of the baileys we could have given nominations to for this award couldn't we i think out of all four of them michael seems to be the only one that has done something this year as it were and he's been involved in others with other characters though, he's got a job in the factory yeah, he's made these links a bit of the baileys i think james is the only one i don't really know what his personality is mm. or maybe he's one of these people that just doesn't have one he's he's shy and sensitive like aggie ed and and michael i feel are really fleshed out and i know what their personalities are like and in this situation i think you could guess how would ed react to this or what would aggie say if this happened what would Michael do? Like James, it's like a cipher. He doesn't exist. He's like a, like a, a you know, like a blank space to insert whatever here. Yeah. If and any drama happened, I think he'd just kind of back out the room or go upstairs. Like, oh, football! Don't know. Yeah. So let's. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. Let, let's say let's let's have more development of James's character this year because I don't I don't like giving up on any characters, but. There just hasn't been enough so far for us to invest in for him, has there? And and maybe when we come to do this award this time next year, and and hopefully it, the the pandemic isn't a reason why so many characters haven't made as many appearances as these, as you might expect. We'll be able to. Um, I know we we would hopefully be able to be a bit more, um, bit a bit less forgiving, a bit more scathing. I don't know in our in our choices for that one. Uh, well, let's let's do the next award then, which is the Build Up to Nout Award. Um, and this this always happens. There's always some stories on Coronation Street where it feels like something's going to be a bigger deal than it actually ended up being, isn't there? It gets announced in the tabloids, it gets put on the front page of the soap mags, it gets, you know, Ian McLeod or whoever does the interviews about what's coming up soon and it's like, oh, juicy, you bet you can't, you can't wait until this story comes. This is going to blow your minds and then when it actually comes along it's kind of a bit of a, a dribble or or it's a or it's a secret that a character's built up that actually is just like oh is that it and you're left feeling like it could have been some so much more there's lots of things that happen this year like that for example aggie's big secret about why she left nursing which turned out like a guy died yeah that was she she ended up getting and i can't remember whether this was early this year or late last year it was last when she year got the, because the she got the field. award because robert died at christmas and then it was in january i think oh yeah or after yeah, then it's definitely right. after them they're like oh you get an award for helping somebody and it's like she was a nurse yeah she got that she got the award and then she was thinking oh well, maybe i should go back to nursing oh but why did i leave nursing and and there was supposed to be some huge yeah it's because they were too scared to make secret. Aggie look bad and they also thought well if it's too bad she can't go back to nursing yeah exactly and it was just that some old guy died on her watch but it wasn't that she gave him the wrong medicine it was or that she was do... neglectful or anything I can't remember if there was neglect or, or something involved but it wasn't her fault no so it was like okay whatever yeah and so then it was not a great secret we're like... not invested enough in Aggie to to and they didn't also Coronation Street didn't invest enough in the story this could have been a really big deal if we'd seen it happen on the show, mm. wow, that would have been quite incredible. But because it was like recollections of something that happened to somebody we don't know like five years ago, it was yeah. like, okay, I don't care. Mm, mm, definitely. And then you've got Jade's exit, which is like, <laughs> hit with a breadboard and goes. No, well, she, she got hit with a breadboard, <laughs> went, came back again. And then within and the space of an episode, nice, tried, she? yeah, she she tried to be nice. Then she and then I think Tyrone got her a 
birthday present, a bracelet or something. So she goes in for a kiss with Tyrone. Hope finds out about it, says, I don't like you anymore. And Jade slinks off. And I remember being sure at the time thinking, oh, she'll, she'll be, be back. She'll be back. She's not done yet. Jade wouldn't give up this easily. But literally, we've she not did. seen anything from her since. And I know. I a like, lot of oh. these things are like, obviously, another victim of COVID. But we can only live in the reality that we've been given. And I, I don't... unfortunately, you can't just excuse everything well no and, and this story ended in like late january time early february maybe well and, you know and who so knows I, she might have come she they're, might they're, have been plat this is the thing we'll never know unless they tell us and you can't believe everything you get told anyway and we still watched a show that existed in the world whether or not there were plans for things it doesn't really matter because we can only judge it by the finished product mm. and this story was you know fairly big for autumn 2019 early early 2020 the you know the the revelation of john stape having a secret daughter and trying to break apart fizz and tyrone you know one of the most solid couples on the street there was the, the chopping board attack was quite quite fun but it just it was a sad whimpering out unfortunately um, I, I felt it could have been more. Bethany dating James was also a bit of a... Because it was like the great secret is that he's gay and she's his beard. And it's don't tell anybody. And then he let her run around snogging Daniel and didn't make any comments about it. Or so it didn't seem to, to like raise any conflict. Or he, he never no. said, listen, you put me in a bad position here because you said you'd help me out. And now you've you've put me in an awkward position whereby I either pretend that you that we're not dating, in which case what was the point of it to begin with, or I act like I don't care that my girlfriend's snogging another guy. Yeah, and and it it was just nothing. It was just kind of quietly forgotten about, wasn't it? As was a it lot. It was of a really that powerful to story to begin with because Bethany lecturing James about his, you know, responsibility to other gay men to come out was like it was a really interesting perspective of like how bethany how do you think you've got the right to judge him when you have no idea what you're talking about mm. and who and and are you responsible as a as a sort of a per, like a pioneer for rights of the of the group that you represent how responsible are you for making sure that you you know fight for those yeah. rights you know it's not fair to put that on somebody's shoulders and bethany really didn't have a clue when she confronted him and tried to make him feel bad about it mm. and it just kind of like yeah. it was really it was a really powerful setup and it went nowhere mm. uh, yeah another one another similar uh, quite a good setup was the Stillwater battle between ken and charles and it really felt like these two stately gentlemen who were going to go up against each other and that ken was like i'm going to fight for this i'm going to be the leader of still waters i'm going to take down this evil charles and it was also like a really interesting um thing because charles was like who ken wanted to be yeah and then it turned out that he was everything he hated as yeah, well Yeah, corrupt and that never really went anywhere no ken just beat him in the election carl charles sculpt off i literally don't think we saw him again after the and election then ken went, and then don't Ken's want like, it anyway don't, don't want it anyway i'm going home yeah i mean i I don't know whether we combine this with the next one or whether it is separate. I suppose it's separate. The whole affair with Ken leaving the street, that that made waves across the social media and the soap world at the end of the 10,000th episode where Ken declares to Eccles that he's finally had enough of living on Coronation Street and he is going to move away. And do you remember the headlines after? It's like, I do. Ken I remember to leave thinking... Coronation Street, which is total clickbait, obviously. I remember watching it. I remember seeing all this reaction going, you guys know this isn't going to happen though, don't you? Mm. I was just bemused that people bought in so whole, wholesale to this obvious misdirection. There's no way Ken was going to leave before the 60th. No way. No, I mean, I I might have thought, okay, maybe he'll stay there longer, but there was obviously no plan for him to stay there longer, and it would have been very interesting to see what like happened with the yeah with the pandemic, you know, and everything that happened with care homes there. But luckily, it was over by then. <laughs> but um, I, I yeah, I thought well, maybe they maybe they will have him stay there, and, and and I liked the fact that there were these scenes that were filmed at a different place. It was away from the yeah, street like and that. everything. But the fact that you know after what a month. Ken's back living on the street again <laughs> and Claudia, lovely, lovely Claudia, we had to say goodbye I to. I know, that was, that was a bugger. Yeah. Um, the, the sinkhole. Now, now the sinkhole. <laughs> the fact that there's a giant hole in David's garden 
and nobody cares about it. It's just, it's a joke. It's I want to circle into back a to massive this. joke. Um, the other one this year was Roxy's no one. Roxy's just a woman called Roxy. I don't know whether that was something that was built up was, by viewers yeah, rather than coronation I think this was a fandom joke. hype that w- got Roxy. out of control and we probably contributed to it somewhat whereby we were like going, Roxy's a secret alias for somebody else. Who is it? Is it Debbie? Well, also, yeah, exactly. Well, when when it was revealed that Debbie was working for It would have been Ray. so we, easy for them to... I think, honestly, I think... I think a lot of us thought... Somebody oh, so, didn't join the dots here. I think it would have been just really obvious to say that Roxy and Debbie are the same person. Well, it took two or three weeks for us to realise that Debbie wasn't Roxy. <laughs> no, because they had Roxy, Roxy going to visit Ray. It was like, oh, I... We, we, that's Roxy. It isn't Debbie Roxy. And she doesn't it's even... She doesn't even get alive. The thing, she, she wasn't even a speaking part. That was the that was the kicker, wasn't it? Yeah. It's like, Roxy, this kind of Machiavelli, Machiavellian genius behind... Ray, it's just a random anonymous woman with a handbag. Yeah, fine. Yeah. I, I'm gonna. I want to give this to the sink card. I kind of do as well because it just it feels like such a missed opportunity of like a weird, like elaborate CG stunt that that was wasted absolutely. From why is it there? Nothing's happened. Nothing's fallen in it. Nothing's coming out of it. You know, there's no leaking or like there's no flooding. It's just a hole in in David's garden that they talk about sometimes. That they reference so rarely that you wouldn't you would think it was like a, a misplaced paving stone, not a giant dirty hole with where there are children, young children living in this house with access to the outside. A small dog that needs to use the garden to do whittles and poos. You'd think he would have fallen in a few times. Mm. And nothing. It, it, and nobody's it really... trying to remedy it. Nobody cares. I mean, it, it's been a. <laughs> and the fact also it's that it was David deciding to sell it. Yeah, up. and the fact also that it was like created by some evil genius who works in the water department who can apparently just create sinkholes at will in people's gardens. This seems to be like a really important unaddressed issue in Weatherfield that there's a man who can just snap his fingers and make a sinkhole appear. Yeah. It's like it's like there's a like an evil villain, like a superhero movie, working in the council and nobody <laughs> notices or cares. I mean the thing is, when when it was revealed that there was going to be a sinkhole in David Platt's garden, I, I think there were a lot of eye rolls in the in the soap spoiler community going, "Really, a si- you go you go with a sinkhole?" But then also it was it was a bit like, well, if they're going to have a sinkhole in a soap, which is fairly unrealistic, surely something or someone is going to fall into that <laughs> yes. sinkhole. It writes it's che- itself, really, it is doesn't Chekhov. it? Like, the new... Instead of, like, Chekhov's gun, you know where you say, like, if you shoot yeah. a gun in the first act, it has to fire in the third act. It's like, the, the, the equivalent of something that doesn't manifest itself is David Sinkhole. Yeah. <laughs> whereby you have a plot device that never gets used for I, any I can only think that there were going to be much, much bigger yeah. plans for this for the 60th. But Digger this is down the thing. there, Ray down there. Like, I, I don't know, but I don't it wasn't, feel too so. bad. Like other things, I feel bad. Like I, I can't condemn somebody for their own health not coming into the show, yeah, and therefore not being in it very much. But I can certainly condemn a TV show for going. Should we just do it anyway? Yeah, let's just do it anyway. Well, that's but you don't need to do it if it's not gonna. It's not gonna go anywhere. Don't go to the effort. Of doing it in the first place. How much money did you waste? And I know, I, I know they plan these things a long time in yeah, advance. They do. So maybe like, I mean, this time last year, I'm sure they knew there was going to be a sinkhole in David's garden. Oh, they definitely. Uh, and and you might think, well, why did they just not? Why didn't they just come up with another reason why David could have left? Maybe they could, but maybe they just thought, well, you I know, mean, maybe they the already... spectacle of a sinkhole. But then apparently Hollyoaks also had a sinkhole, so it wasn't even a no novel. If you... I can only imagine that they had contracted somebody to do the effects and they had to pay them. <laughs> I mean, that's the only reason I could give them a pass on this. Yeah. I... And really, just pay them and do something different. I, I suppose the only thing that I would say possibly against this, and, and I don't think that this is seriously going to count up against this, the build-up to now, to me, makes should be there is a build-up to something and nothing happens. There wasn't a build-up to the sinkhole in the show. It just appeared, didn't it? <laughs> but, you know, outside the show, in the in the weeks leading up to it, if you were aware that this was coming, there was a bit of a build-up. And, and once it happened, it's like this you immediately felt this is going to be something big, but it just never was. Whereas things, something like Aggie's Secret, it was it was built up. Jade's story was a build-up, which kind of 
did, didn't land properly. Ken's exit as well, but well, to, well. to me, it's between Ken's exit and the sinkhole. But I, I think, like you said, it's almost the, the Chekhov's gun replacement. That the symbol of that didn't really work. No, that didn't go anywhere. Has it's got and to go to the sinkhole? The other thing that kind of annoys me about it, and I'm sure. The, I'm sure there are people who work in Quarry that feel the same way about this. They've they've now lost the opportunity to use it as a plot device for 20 years. They can't have another sinkhole on Coronation Street without oh, another one. You know what I mean? Like they they they've ruined their opportunity. That could have been a really good story, but they've just wasted it on on nothing. Yeah, I mean to be honest, to go along with the sinkhole, we could say that this Ray's story is a bit of a build up to now because. We still yeah, don't true. believe that these houses are going to be knocked down. But the fact that the story, as I mean, as of recording, Thursday the 21st of January 2021, there still is a potential for them to knock these houses down. We can't say, well, that that wasn't that exciting. But I think we know it's not going to happen. But, um, you yeah, know, maybe that can be a nominee for, for next year. But OK, David Sinkhole, Build Up To That Award. Congratulations. Um, next up, we have got the Weatherfield Waterworks Award. <laughs> and I almost feel bad about this award because it kind of feels like it's getting a bit close to the Mardi Mayor, really, doesn't it? This was an award that was um, introduced a couple of years ago so that we could, you know, make a joke out of the fact that Rana it was, basically was crying to make all of the Rana. time. Basically. But we, we've kept up. We've not got rid of any awards this year, even though maybe we should have done. So um, rather, than, I suppose the Mardi Mayor has been who's been the narkiest, naggiest a woman of the year and this doesn't necessarily have to be a woman who gets this award of course i'm not saying that but this is more just who just you know can't plug those tears needs uh, uh and so we've got leanne again <laughs> as a, a good reason for crying i'm not saying it's not but she certainly uh, went through it's at least about, one box of tissues it's not, this a sto- year. it's not like an award for who cried for no reason <laughs> no it's just who you know, because ron has certainly had very many reasons sniff the most onions this to be year. crying this is the more of a case of like where where have the um production staff gone oh they're good at crying let's make them cry more like leanne like jane danson brilliant so Expert also fire. Emma, who's played by Ali Mardell, fantastic, and also mm. Carla. Oh, all good criers. Really amazing. They they can they seem to be able to switch. I mean, we don't watch. We haven't seen any of these people perform um, behind the scenes, so I don't know how long it takes them to get into character. It seems <laughs> like they can snip, snip their fingers and immediately summon floods of tears. Um, I think I think Leanne is the master here. I can, can I also say a, a fourth nomination? And I only just thought about this, and I typed it in quite quietly and quickly as you were talking about one of the earlier awards. The quads, I think, should get an honorary <laughs> nomination for Weatherfield Waterworks because... Um, Always we, quiet. We've not seen a whole lot of the quads this year, to be honest, but why heck have we heard them? I mean, it feels crass to say, look on the bright side of a pandemic which has nearly killed 100,000 people in this country, but can we say that the hidden silver lining was that we didn't get to have to watch bloody hundreds of scenes of bloody quads, bloody crying and bloody Gemma and Chesney just rocking babies and, and poking babies in cribs and close ups of babies crying for, for scenes and scenes and scenes and months and weeks of boring, inevitable, mm. just, dull baby hopefully scenes. by the time that they are allowed to bring the quads back into the show again they'll have gone past the constant crying stage well i'm not an expert on young humans but i assume there comes a point where they don't just cry i'm trying to work out in this in this episode what where's the filter for people to stop listening if they find this offensive and if you didn't find what i just said offensive then I guess you're cool. <laughs> and if you did, why are you still listening? So looking at all the, those other nominees then, and this is, this we haven't got very many nominees. Emma I've kind of put in there because she 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 is a good cry. I, don't, I wouldn't say that she's done loads of crying this year, no. but that scene where she was arrested, yeah. that broke my little heart that did. And yeah. she was, uh, oh, I'm so sorry that I Again, took the money though, from Scott. This was the year that she killed Eccles. Oh yes, she did have a good old cry then, didn't she? <laughs> she was she, did she was unfairly cry while Eccles died. She was unfairly punished by the Barlows for being the one that had to take Eccles to the vet when she was sick and therefore killed Eccles mm. by by seeking medical treatment. And I don't know whether I win for Emma in this instance. Might I mean you no, know, because Coronation Street takes 
of a very serious note of all the outcomes of these. I don't know whether that would make them back their ideas up and stop Emma crying quite so much. I don't like she was like actually Emma an awful lot better category. when she was cheery and chirpy I and think funny. Ali Mardell's a victim of her own talent, whereby she's very good at doing comedy and drama. And there's probably, I, I don't know, I feel like sometimes the drama gets more attention, but people enjoy the comedy more than they do like i think people post about sad things that happen to people that they like more on social media but i also think that we prefer to watch just general happy comedy scenes and emma's better at those Mm. i want to give this to carla because i think um she's been floundering for a long time but this storyline with with um peter you know, it has been, it's kind of ramped up, obviously, this, this month, but it hasn't been absent. For, it's obviously been going on for a long time. Just her, her crying and her desperation and this idea that she's got in her head that her life is better because Peter's in it, which is so misguided, it's ridiculous. It's a mixture of kind of crying and begging, isn't it, for Peter, don't leave me. And I certainly don't want to get anyone thinking that her ordeal where she was talking about oh, yeah, how she was she taken coped, advantage like, of in the slum. Well, she was raped by somebody, and that's not you know I'm not. A... No, exactly. But this she... is a, it's also like this is another thing. This is another thing where it's a gendered, a gendered category where you're making out that expressing your emotion by crying is weak, somehow weak, and it's not. That's not the case. It's just the way that women the one acceptable way that women are allowed to express negative emotions somehow still gets censored no, the fact that we've people. got Bryn and Aled as nominees in this category <laughs> means we're we're fine they're babies <laughs> i'm interested that you said carla because to me that she, she wouldn't necessarily stand out as being the most obvious one she has had a, a fair amount of misery this year but i i think for the sheer you know volume of salty goodness that has come out of oh, no. Leanne's eye socket makes me think that maybe we should we should give it to her. I mean, is this the award for the person who you're genuinely concerned about, like the actress or the actor behind the character, are you genuinely concerned that they might be suffering from dehydration? Because when Rana was crying, like, almost every episode, I did want to send Bavna some, like, coconut water just to rehydrate her. I, I think that you're right that, that Jane Danson is by far the... would be the best recipient of, like, a big case of... Yeah. Yeah. Like Coca Vita. <laughs> I, that, that's what I'm thinking more than Carla. And yeah. The, the, okay. even, even the quads I might put out there, but that's uh, well, that you know. it's silly. So <laughs> can we can we give it to Leanne? Okay. Like, did, did we give Leanne the Mardi Mail? I can't even remember it so long yeah, ago. I think so. so she's got the Mardi Mail I mean, and the Weatherfield Water. This is why you shouldn't really Jane. take this very seriously because we can't even remember what we said like <laughs> an hour ago. It's all fine, everything. Just chill out. This is like. Of all the things that could happen, this award ceremony is by far nowhere near the worst. <laughs> no, Gemma, next award, please. What have we got? So this was the No One Can Ever Know Award, no where know. like you might as well just copy-paste this into any situation where characters are trying to keep a secret from other people for no real reason other than it creates drama. Especially and, when it comes out. And Coronation Street's been pretty good at not doing this so much, but there's still too many examples mm. of pointless secrets. Like, for example... Toya being quiet about Ali being on drugs. Yeah, she found she knew that he did have um. What was that? Um, was that amphetamine? I can't remember the uh, some drugs. kind of drug addiction um, because of the, the 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 trauma caused by the fact that he murdered what was his name, blokey villain. I've forgotten. Right, Ronan. I did it, Ronan. That's right. Um, and then Toya finds out about it, but rather than saying anything. Um, and to other people that might be able to help him, she just leaves it go so far that he collapses in the middle of um, an appointment. And then gets herself fired yeah. as a counsellor so she can go on to work at the factory, the factory. doing nothing. Yeah. Um, we've got Sarah not telling anybody why she's still protecting Gary. So, um, Well, it's not just not telling anybody, it's like telling specific people who would probably benefit from the knowledge. Well, Sarah, Sarah knows that Gary killed Rick Nealon and. Um, she she's kept that quiet, and I know it's because he's also n- knows about her involvement in Callum's murder cover up, but um, it, it's still quite a big Honestly, secret. Honestly, don't know why she just doesn't say. There's a murderer living among them. Like, what evidence does Gary have? 
If Gary said, oh, I'll tell everyone you killed her, I'll be like, go on then. They won't believe you. I'll just say I didn't. What mm-hmm. can you say? And tap. also, the other thing is, the person who actually killed, um, oh, what's his name? Callum, is dead. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> um, Billy doesn't tell Eileen about what's going on with Todd. So we had in um, kind of early mid-autumn time, t- oh, uh, yeah. Billy finds out. I've got out. a letter. She, he literally opened, was it Sean? Opened post to Eileen from Todd and yeah. was like, well, I won't, I won't, won't tell follow Eileen her this. about this. I'll tell you what, some of the posts we've been getting recently, I wish there was somebody who would intercept it and just hide <laughs> it somewhere. Um, yeah, they, all, all of that. And then they think that Todd's dead because they find his um, oh, yeah. bag by the canal. Where's that and... lady? She should have been in the where the hell have you gone? Yeah, the, the woman who's... The, um... the, the accomplice. Yeah, that said that she wasn't. Yeah, nothing's ever with mm, her, has it? Interesting. Um, and she, she seemed... She had a lot of lines for somebody. Eileen eventually reason. finds out, because she's in Thailand, of course, at the moment, wasn't mm. she? Because Sue Cleaver was away from the programme for quite a bit. And she, she finds out eventually. But that, that did seem to be quite, you know, an important bit of information, we suspect, <laughs> maybe. Your son, who has been on the run for, you know, a good few years now, is, is made contact, and, and we think there's a lead in the case but we're not going to tell you about that. Mm. You don't want to know about that, do you? Um, no. Peter and everybody around it, kind of Carla and everyone, I can't remember who was involved, don't tell Kevin about the fact that Abby is back on the drugs when she had that morphine, that little mini relapse into a morphine addiction. Which one was that? Three, four months There should probably ago. be... Oh no, I don't tell this. the boyfriend. There should probably be another award for... Um, like non-speaking extras called why are you doing that you absolute idiot which should go obviously to the nurse who left dr- an unattended drug trolley in the room of a drug a recovering drug addict oh i might i might just add that as a nominee for my net for our next category we can come back to that one later oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, we've also got as a nominee for the uh, no one can ever know award nick's got a son but doesn't tell leanne straight away <laughs> Um, Leanne underplays Oliver's symptoms to Dr. Schmitz when she's trying to get him to come over and um, wave his magic wand at him. She doesn't tell him exactly the severity of his seizures. Um, Johnny doesn't tell Jenny about his um, naughty past with Scott. And also Arthur not telling Evelyn that he's oh, got a secret this is wife. Really hard. Maybe. There are so many really good these are so many good ones i don't know whether there's anything here that massively jumps out to me about this is absolutely ridiculous why didn't you tell anyone that i think a lot of them i can understand i i could be convinced into yeah that's maybe a good reason for right so let's go through them so so toya being quiet about ali being on drugs seemed like a bit of a suicide mission from her like she was she bored of being a counsellor and just wanted to go up in flames I th- there was a period during this where she thought that he got over them i, I think not convinced i think right. when, apologies. Oh, sorry, oh my god my watch my jump. apologies um yeah my, my watch uh no sorry <laughs> toya um didn't realize yeah. that he was still having problems when he came to his collapse i think but i mean he, maybe she could have told right somebody. so maybe keep that one in to one side no, possibly and Sarah, I really like Sarah can see why that she's trying to she she feels like she's going to yeah, get in trouble that makes there, sense Billy not telling Eileen about the Todd stuff that didn't make any that's sense that's kind of dumb yeah Peter and Co not telling Kevin about Abby's addiction well they're trying to help her out but it wasn't really a good idea Nick's got a son doesn't tell Ian. see this is one where the longer you keep it a secret the more it's going to bite you in the bum there are a few like this in here like I think it's inevitable it's going to come out, so you might as well say it straight away. That's so, the thing, isn't Nick, it? Like, some of these could uh, theoretically have been swept into the carpet if this wasn't a soap. Like, if if this wasn't a soap, Ali probably would have been able to keep this under wraps and not implicate Toya. If this wasn't a soap, then perhaps um, Abby would have been able to keep it from Kevin that she was being tempted but definitely at some point nick's son would have come out of the woodwork and, he, also, and he's keeping it a secret to protect leanne and she's going through something else and maybe this is one bombshell too many for a woman whose son is you know not long left for this world but like nick uh, leanne underplaying all of the symptoms with dr schmitz that was really dumb because they there's no way they would not have found this out yeah when they came over but that's his das <laughs> arthur being married another one i think 
I, he I, could have got away with it, especially, you know, she she died recently. He only had to hold on. He only had to, you I'll know, tell you a what, couple he more months I'll tell you secrets. What he shouldn't have held on to. That what? big bouquet of flowers coming out of the florist. Going, oh, no, this is for my dead <laughs> wife, so it's not for you, Evelyn. Uh, I think maybe Leanne lying about all of the symptoms is the, is the silliest it seemed, one. It I mean, feels it like the biggest the thing, life and death. Yeah, because also, it wasn't like she was the only holder of the knowledge. And other people were saying... Well, I'm going to tell them because they have to know. Like, the, the the hospital knew. Steve knew. The doctors would have known as soon as they got there. Yeah. It's sad because she, she wasn't doing it to be Malicious, devious. No. She, she honestly thought that if Schmitz came over to England and, took, uh, and looked at Ollie, he, he'd be able to do it. He'd be able to go, wow, well, he's, a, he's a bit faster than you said, but I'll do my best, yeah? Do you know, in, in, in funny thing in Germany, fast means sausage. <laughs> Would you like one? I brought some with me. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, can't, I don't know whether, I don't want to turn this into a, we give all the awards to Leanne, because this would be the, this would be a hat trick for Leanne if yeah. she wins this one. I'm, and I'm I do like it. Leanne a heck of a lot more than I used to. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, the Eileen thing is, a, a, a fairly decent contender here. A, as don't is... not give it to somebody just because you don't want to give them all no, the No, I know, I know. But also, we haven't even talked about the Johnny not telling Jenny about him and Scott. And I think if oh, that was if silly. he had earlier, she she might have understood. And... Well, also, she wouldn't have played into Scott's hands quite so much mm. and given Scott so much so many opportunities to menace and harass him. Like, wasn't the fact he kept it quiet? One of the reasons why Scott ended up like living in the pub with him. Yeah. If but, he had just said to Jenny, like, look, look. Yeah, listen. he put his he put his wife at risk. Yeah. Basically. Maybe and that's I right, and I yeah. think that that that's fairly unforgivable. And Jenny's a bit of a saint for sticking with him, although I mean she's not happy with him. Yeah, I think this is a, in a case of like that's only made things worse. Perhaps that is the contender because actually Leanne lying didn't lead anywhere because the doctor went okay i will just check with the hospital oh, no, and she's like no bad. damn it i thought you'd take my word for it as an expert yeah yeah i think the ramifications of johnny not telling jenny about scott were slightly more serious ended up with a with a um a, a armed standoff in the bar exactly so can we give it to that okay leanne you got a reprieve oh is she gonna is she gonna be nominated somewhere I don't else know, i don't know let's find out the next award <laughs> Your daft epith award, and this is where we award people for just doing something stupid. Is it a cultural appropriation for you to do an accent? It's fine. I've been doing because it for eight from, and a half years. Because you're from podcast. the Midlands, I think you're more qualified than I am. Uh-huh. Aren't you? Your daft epith fizz. You swap Jade round the head with a chopping board. Why'd you do that for? <laughs> that that was quite funny. That's just a brilliant moment from last year, and I love <laughs> Fizz's reaction to just going whoops, fizz, putting the hands fizz up to her like, mouth. Like, what, what have I just done? Like, Oh no, I'm nominated oh, for the that. Daft Apeth Award for that one, aren't it, I? It was, she didn't think about it, she just acted because she was trying to protect her child. But you don't go around just whacking people over the head with a chopping oh, board you? and think you can get away with it, Fizz. Um, Maria sticking with Gary, despite discovering that he's a loan shark, marrying him and everything. Like, uh, if you find out kid. that you're, yeah, you're, your boyfriend slash fiancé is a lone shark and has been intimidating people and he might well say he's had his reasons. I think you, you don't yeah. want to go down that route. He, no. He's not so great. I think you've got to be a bit more responsible, Maria. Yeah, I mean, Maria, you've had so many men. Surely yeah. you must realise that there are better options out there for you than Gary. Yeah. Um, Bernie trying to catfish Cal that time when she pretended to be a 14-year-old boy who wanted DJ lessons and luring him to the woods I thought so that, that worked she quite could film well, him. so she could, like, beat him with a stick or whatever. She it was remember. never going to work, was it? He was never going to... <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't agree with that because there are so many videos on... We spoke about this at the time. There are so many videos on online of, like, vigilante anti-paedophile groups cat doing exactly this like luring men to and it's always men um to public places where they think they're meeting a child for sex and then humiliating them i think the problem was that bernie just didn't really like know what to do when she got him to stand no that was that was the thing and and (laughs) all that she did was lure him to a forest because i don't think they he I don't know whether Kel did think that that's what was going to happen. I think he might have had a bag of condoms, maybe. But this is the thing. I, this it is another really to me. Held up. Massive missed opportunity, like the sinkhole. Like 
like James um, and and Bethany, Bethany, where I think, oh, this could have been a really good story if you had just actually made this an A story, mm-hmm. because there's so much to be said about like online like doxing and vigilantism and like taking the law into your own hands and you know is there a victim here who is there a child there who would have been saved because you did this even though it's illegal or are you actually like impeding like the wheels of justice because now the police can't get him on you know other other crimes that he might have committed this is the thing it's not as cut and dried as you think it is it's a really complicated issue and it's a really, really timely one as well. And they just mm. kind of like chucked it in as like a little kind of midweek cliffhanger. Yeah, I mean, the, the Kel and Paul story was certainly an A story of well, sorts for a bit, wasn't it? it? But even that, know, to me, they... feels like it's that's almost like a build up to now. Like, oh, and, and then Kel died. So that <laughs> solved that. <sighs> Paul's, we didn't see it or anything. They the, just unfortunate, him out of the, canal. the unfortunate thing about Paul's story is that it's fascinating an important story to tell which has now been relegated to part of a love triangle mm. unfortunate i think because that you know it, he's he's a really complicated person and this is this thing that happens to real people and they sort of deserve to have their stories told not as part of a like who who will billy choose todd or paul i don't know you know we can have that story about that those characters without introducing this really interesting that could be a separate thing. Mm, Can you mm. not just make it a separate thing? Who else has been a daft apath this year, Gemma? Oh, blimmin' Daniel not wanting to get Bertie vaccinated. They did and... bring up the whole thing of anti-vaxxer and he said he wasn't that. But um, I'm I... not an anti-vaxxer, I'm just against vaccinations. I think it was all it was all tied up with the, with the Sinead thing and, the, and he didn't like his medicine and... Uh... Yeah, for a little bit. And that did kind of lead to Maria having chicken pox and then miscarrying. So it backfired a little bit, didn't it, Daniel? You're daft acre. And it's unfortunate, again, it's another missed opportunity in like a year where anti-vaxxers actually threaten the like the global economy and like people's lives. It's not just a case of, you know, a few cases of... You know, it's always a threat to public health when people refuse to get vaccinated for spurious reasons. But this is even more topical now and they kind of threw it away right at the beginning of the year. Mm. And and really, Daniel didn't account for his, his beliefs. And it's like they flirted with the idea of anti-vax, but they didn't want to really commit themselves. Yeah, yeah. And it's weird because they went all the way with Sinead and her like, I can beat cancer with green smoothie like woo-woo science, it's like, are the anti-vaxxers that scary that you're afraid to tackle them by saying you're just being nuts mm. and you're endangering people and killing them? What proportion of Coronation Street audience are anti vax What proportion of Conversation Street before our, uh, audience are anti-vaxxers? I guess we find out when we look at our uh, our viewers' numbers for next one. But, oh, no, I, I, remember, totally agree. I remember having a friend, uh, like a best friend at school, whose mum was an anti-vaxxer. And the thing about it is there are genuine reasons to not take a vaccination. Uh, but if you take them because you're morally opposed or you think you've read something on Facebook, all you're doing is hurting people that genuinely cannot take them for a biological medical reason. I find needles scary. Shut up. <laughs> um, speaking of Daniel, that wasn't the only silly thing he did last spring. He also proposed to Bethany, but called her Sinead at one point. And this was just, uh, this precipitated Bethany's exit, really. But he got down on one knee. And I thought that was quite a great moment, actually, when he came and said Sinead. And it was like a, ah, oh, fist in mouth kind of a uh, moment. But yeah, if you're going to propose to someone, Daniel, get the name right. Otherwise, it's, um, it's, it's probably not going to say yes. Um, At all... least you didn't get the name engraved wrong. That's true. Um, we've got Asha taking her clothes off um, in front of the cameras for Corey. Um, yes, she was kind of at this point felt that she she had no choice. But I'm she... I don't I want to I want you want to... to distance yourself from this nomination. I can't involve myself in this because I don't understand. I'm kind of why... saying she. I don't understand why anyone would do this. It seems insane to me to do this. And there's certainly a lot of teaching at schools that said don't do it. enough people do this that it makes uh, yeah. me think that there's a, there is a reason that I don't fully get. It is rife among teenagers to, you know, send the 
send the naughty pictures on the on the text just messages and the WhatsApp and the just, Snapchats and everything. But just don't. Literally don't, don't do it. Papers. You really, you really should. Especially this boy I'm that sorry, you don't I really don't... know that well, Asher. Look, if you wanted to, if you look, if you want to do something like that, first of all, you need twenty years at least of marriage under your belt. <laughs> you want to have five kids and a mortgage of over three hundred grand. And that's all I'm going to say. And so I'm we're part way there for you stripping. I'm not the even. For me, but... I'm. I'm not even halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> twenty years of marriage. Um, we've we haven't got... got twenty years of marriage. No, so you said twenty years. We're yeah. over halfway there. Now. How many kids have we got? <laughs> we haven't got two and a half kids, have we? We do not. Um, <laughs> David goading Yobs for fun is another apathy thing oh, that, that went was on this silly, year. Yeah. He decided to get his kicks by, um, yeah, trying to get people to chase up after him i and... kind of enjoyed this but i also felt a bit like the the fact that the coronation street starkly laid out the reasoning behind it was basically oh it felt a bit too similar to have two mourning husbands so we thought we'd make one of them a bit loopy just for fun <laughs> i thought it was kind of fun it wasn't david's you know finest storyline it I was, was to a very come up david with a top thing 10, to david... do David's stories it wouldn't be up there but I did, I did quite enjoy the scenes of him running away grinning his head off and um, jumping on cars and kicking over bikes and things but um, not really the most sensible things to do especially when you've only got little legs like David as well I mean he really could have got himself into a lot of trouble by doing this and thank goodness he came to his senses and stopped is all I can say um, Paul giving his phone number to Will when he was working at the uh, the counselling service not a couple of months that, ago. Not only that, but that he was expressly told many times not to do it and literally was part of several conversations involving Todd giving him meaningful looks whereby they discussed that it was a stupid thing to do and you should never do it. Yeah, his heart's just too big, isn't it? But... I mean, I've, I've, we've seen and we've been contacted by people who've worked for people like the Samaritans and that, that rule about don't get personally involved, don't give out your phone numbers is so, you know, drilled into anybody that works for these services. It just, to somebody who has worked for them, this story must have seemed absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that Paul's been there five minutes and is walking straight into this trap that he, re- he really shouldn't have done and, and we're supposed to find it in a way endearing because he's just so lovely. I just watched it and went, you brought this all on yourself, Paul, you daft baker. The equivalent to this, to me, would be like being an MP and accepting a bribe. Mm. Unfortunately for Paul, that's that's, that's very well happened. established yeah. as a behaviour, if you're a <laughs> um, yeah, politician. I've got Jeff going to heckle Elaine in hospital <clears throat> when he was on the cusp of victory in his case um, where he was uh, up against Yasmin in court. He decided to go and screw it up by intimidating Elaine Yes, he had a mask over his face. Yes, he parked far away from the hospital. But if he, he, he took a pretty massive risk doing that. And um, it was his downfall, really. Well, his actual downfall was when he fell down from the roof. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, 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 shouldn't have, he, he probably could have had a better chance of getting away from it if he hasn't if he'd been able to resist the temptation there I think oh wow and then a uh, final late entry to this one Gemma the nurse the nurse who left earlier. drugs in a ex-drug addict's room yeah <laughs> I feel like that deserves a shout out but maybe not a win because it it feels like a minor blip in Corrie 2020 um who you want to give this to I mean that it depends you've got some life and death moments like Maria sticking with Gary like this this known villain dodgy um murky past kind of guy sticking with him when you really shouldn't that seems like a really stupid thing to do um i mean some of them are just goofy like daniel proposing to bethany be calling a sinead and and asher you could maybe forgive the naivety of youth um i i i kind of am going towards paul giving his phone number to will out of all of these seems like Maybe it's just because it's fresh in my mind. But out of all of these, that's what I was, you know, face palming the most about maybe this year. What I do you don't know. Think? I think the vaccination thing gets to me the most because there are... Oh, that, the consequences of that. Maria the consequences baby. were literally a, a child, an unborn child died. Mm. And and his his excuse was so flimsy. It's like, I didn't want to see him crying. It's like he cries when he poos his pants. Oh, yeah, that's what he said, wasn't it? You're right. I've your child, that your baby will cry continuously. I mean, when, when your child gets to be a toddler, it will cry because you won't feed it 
dinner when it's mm. already eaten its dinner or like it wants pizza but it doesn't want a pizza with cheese on it or something. We also like you, you have to just have a stiff upper lip and say, I know what's best for you, I'm the parent. You have to get vaccinated. We also haven't seen the, the final consequences of Paul giving his phone number out to Will, have we? Because that, that storyline's been put on ice yeah. for a little bit and um, I, I think Todd's still scheming away. It annoyed me. I thought this was silly because there are reasons why you would be an anti-vaxxer. I don't agree with them. I can sympathise with people who feel as though they understand the situation and they've been misinformed. I don't... I don't... I don't get how you would get yourself in that situation, but people don't do it for, they don't do it to, to hurt people, do they? They, no. do they just kind of, there's so much misinformation online and you get yourself kind of involved in like a cult-like mentality of thinking that you know the real reality. And that, that's kind of like been the, the theme of being on online and like, you know, even stuff like Trump and QAnon and, like this idea that there's a, an alternate reality of things that are being hidden from everybody else and you know because you went on Facebook mm. and you followed the right people. It's a trap and many people fall into it, even people that are supposedly educated and intelligent. Yeah, like but, but that wasn't what Daniel's big objection was. It was like my my kid cried. Yeah. Kid cried. My, my my wife's died recently, so I don't really like hospitals. Sorry, well, Maria, you're going to have to take the fall for this one. Yeah, sorry. Okay, well, that, that's fine. I, I think for the, the consequences of that, Dan, you're not getting Bertie vaccinated. That uh, does seem right. Uh, it just feel, also feels like mistake. he completely got away with it as well. Mm. Like, there was a few awkward moments where, where me and was like, you killed my baby. And he was like, my bad, sorry, won't do that again. <laughs> and then it's like, nobody remembers or, you know... No, nobody remembers it anymore. So it no. feels like it's our duty to call him out on call this. Call him out Bobbins on Awards. it. Right, we have got three categories left. And the next one up is the Character Assassination Award, which is what we award to the the character that's just been, you know, done wrong by over the course of the year and seems to be not quite as good for <laughs> whatever reason as they were 12 months ago. Who should have won this for like the past five years in a row is probably Tim. He's 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 <laughs> crawling his way back up. I tell you, he Only really really weak. is. No, I think he is. Weak. And he is not actually even a nomination because um, I I wouldn't say that he's any worse now than he was this time last year. My nominations for character assassination this year, um, on a personal note, Billy, who I think going into twenty twenty, I would say yeah, I, I like Billy. I've got no problem with Billy. I think I think he's a great character. I, I like Dan Brocklebank. But it just feels like that the more he's getting involved with Paul and being and soppy about it and um and and being somebody who is looking for a victim to save all the time, I, I just don't find him as compelling a character as as I once did, um, which is a shame because I mean he's he's one of my he at the time he was one of my favourite new characters of the past you know, ten years or so. Um, but yeah, Billy, a new archdeacon of Weatherfield, which is it also an odd storyline um, tangent that we haven't covered yet. Going wrong for Billy when he got he got outed as being the one who killed Pete, uh, Susan. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Susan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Peter's alive. Well, that yeah. Since then, he's they they've and they always, I think Coronation Street gets always really tempted with this, and the only people they haven't done this to really is I think the Baileys. Well, they're like, oh, a religious character. Well, think of all the conflict that we can explore with that. Oh, what if they did something that the, that, that went against their beliefs? Mm. And um, and Billy's just. <laughs> and sometimes you just can't get back from it. I really hope that Billy does because I, like I said, I, I have really, really enjoyed Billy in the past. Um, Shona, I think, is worth nominating here. Some people think that Shona has got a lot better this well, year. Well, you Some people would think definitely she's got say this, worse. and I love New Shona. I don't I... mind New Shona. You love her. Yes. Some of New Shona's stuff is great. I think that the fact that she won the Right Laugh Award and the Conversation Street Awards was fair Ooh. play to her. Yeah, um, yeah but very I, prestigious I do, award, I, that. I think I do prefer old Shona, but that's not to say that I don't like New Shona. I just found old Shona a bit insipid and to a nicey nice and agreeable to really and I've said this before it's not just that I didn't I didn't I just 
didn't dislike her. I just thought she was kind of mm, whatever. Oh, and yeah. and and no, I and I didn't think she was a good match for David, but now I do. Mm. Because David needs a challenge, and she's a very challenging person. Well, she's not going to win the character assassination award, Why? is she? Oh no, she won't now. Because yeah, because you think that she's yeah. got better, Johnny. Um, who? Um, I mean, now uh, an ex bank robber when he was just you know a decent, solid, reliable business owner. business owner, come landlord, um, is now a shadow of his former self. Um, we've got Tracy, and this is just tying back to. Um, last New Year, where she ended up with um, with Paula, and and I mean I don't think her character has really really been assassinated by that per se, but it's just the fact that the character in my eyes did something that I don't think that she would have done. Um, Debbie, <laughs> and, and this has been great, and, I, and again I don't think that she should win, but there was no hint of villainy about Debbie Webster in her return in 2019 was there but in 2020 she has come back as the right hand man woman of um you know the biggest well the second biggest villain of the show in of the year so um yeah for having and, she, and again she's claw, clawing her way back up we're, we're seeing that she's regretting well, she's redeeming herself redeeming she, herself yeah. but um yeah she's she's really um yeah she she's she's been done wrong by and um, finally, Daniel as well. And, and one might say that this happened before 2020, but um, with everything that it's happened with, with Bethany, with, with Nikki. Um, and, and again, I, I used to love, love Daniel. And I do think that he was a brilliant casting in the role as Ken's son. Uh, and I certainly haven't give up on him because um, Rob Mallard is a really, really great actor. Uh, but I, I'm not really enjoying seeing him wallowing in the wake of Sinead's death. I think it's between Billy and Daniel for me. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because I think both of them have kind of been made fools of and that the reasons I like them on their original, you know, when they originally came, came into the show, I thought I, I, I enjoyed both of them. And I think I don't like either of them now. Like, Daniel's deeply unlikable and incredibly flawed. He used to just be flawed, but he also you could also see the humanity in him. And he's just kind of... He's cur- he, it's the curse of, the, of having a child. Even though you never see Bertie, somehow he's just boring now. And... and Anything that makes him interesting just also makes him objectionable. Like running around after Nikki and seeing Bethany and and um, like Sinead's ev- everywhere he looks. And tell you what, I also didn't like about Daniel when he was having a go at. Um, oh yeah. Who, who was it that he was accusing? It of? was uh, when was it Sarah that he was accusing of bashing it was, Adam? Yeah, over and the he was head? like, oh yeah, and he was. I would never do something like that. Yeah, um, exactly. Hello, so two thousand and seventeen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You were prime. So you were the one who did it. Yeah, yeah, and I, also, I, and Billy, like you say, he's he's a vic- I think he's a victim of Coronation Street, thinking it's kind of intrigue an intriguing character um, flaw to be religious. That's what I think they think of it. See, I, I I'm surprised because th- those two, to me, although they're up there, I mean, they're more likely to give it to them than say Debbie. I would say that a character assassination is one that you know with a it was a quick one minute they're they're fine and now suddenly they're like what has happened to that character and i would say with billy and daniel it's been more of a gradual decline whereas well, johnny has been a massive victim of this 2020 story with scott and it's not well, like you're I don't... talking about like shooting somebody across a crowded plaza or i'm talking about putting plutonium in their tea over several months yeah yeah we are so what well, yeah the most effective method of assassination I, I i think it's not that i don't like johnny anymore either it's just um he has now got a criminal past and he's kind of been I don't want to say retcon because we don't know what he was doing 20 years ago he didn't say that he was never a bank robber now now that he's been given that backstory um and and I suppose with the MS flaring up as well he is a he is a shadow of his former self like I said To, to me he's had the most the steepest decline in 2020 so I'd be more wanting to give it to him. I mean, we have in the past, haven't we, agreed to disagree and you've given it to one and I've given it to the other in this one. I I, I really I do feel I'm... quite strongly for Johnny for 2020. 
Okay. Is that it? I thought that seemed very easy. Yeah. You sure? I'm a, I'm a very agreeable person, Lovely. as you know. Lovely, Johnny. Please somebody revive him in 2021, because I do... Uh, all of these revive them, please, because I, I, I never give up on a character completely. But I, Johnny and Jenny, I love them as a couple. I really, really, really desperately want to see them do well as the landlords and landlady of the Rovers return. I want to come out fighting um, and, you know, Rovers reopens whenever they're allowed to do that and they are the, the strong, united front behind the bar at the Rovers. But he, he's got a long way to go before that can happen, maybe. Um, we have got, next up, speaking of the Rovers, the Rovers Rubbish Return Award, which is where we look back at any characters that came back in the past year after a period away. And um, actually, it wasn't as good as it maybe we'd hoped it was going to be. So with this, I've literally just taken all of the characters that came back into Coronation Street in 2020, uh, whether they were good or bad, and we'll make the decision about whose was the um, most disappointing return. So, um, Gemma, do you want to just to, to read out our nominees for us? We've got Debbie. Mm-hmm. We've got Natasha. We've got Dylan, Todd, and as a couple, Norris and Frida. Yeah. When I when I came to um, put together the nominees for this award, I thought, oh, we didn't really have any returnees this year, but thinking about yeah, it, actually, that's that's not bad, actually. And I don't know whether many of them have made a huge, huge splash. Well, these aren't necessarily our, the ones we think are bad. These are just no, all these the people are just all of them, aren't they? So yeah. we've got Debbie returns at... Quite unexpectedly, I to think be honest. she's done well. I, think, I don't think that she's had a rubbish return in, in any way. Um, I, I do remember when she came back into it. I don't was it the summer now? It took me a little while to warm up to her. And I remember a lot of the internet was saying, well, hey, Debbie, Debbie's back, brilliant. Sue Devaney, isn't she awesome? And I was like, she's, she's okay. But then when it was revealed that she was working alongside Ray, it's like, I, I, I'm invested in this character now and I'm definitely loving Debbie now. So there's no way I can give this to her. Natasha, that's, it's almost like she's been a vehicle to bring Sam into the show. And Natasha what do you herself... Mean almost like... That is she exactly hasn't what done she is. anything herself, really, apart no. from chaperone this young child. I, I, she's, I think she's literally just become the mother. Yeah, um, th- there's been no attempt really to develop the character to you know give her any you know, secret motivations to get any more revenge or or, or anything. Um, it's her story has been about Sam. Um, she's which basically, is a shame. honestly, I, I do like her, but she is a bit of a victim of the story in in that she's like. She's she's nice when when the story needs it to be nice. She's Difficult. sad. Yeah, she yeah she's objectionable. She goes to London when the story's when it's convenient. Like she's there's nothing about her at all that's that's kind of autonomous. No, and and but the thing is that kind of fits with what she was like when she was in the program ten years ago. And I know <laughs> that people will hate me for saying this because she had an awesome exit ten years ago, and I don't deny that. But for the two three years that she was in the program, she really didn't have an awful lot to do. She was literally the background girl in the salon. She's so like, the fact that ten years later they still haven't been able to give her much interesting to do, maybe that fits. And it's a shame because I think that um, she she appears to be a very very capable actress. I think she has got a lot of charisma when in the brief scenes where the character has needed to show it, but Corey just doesn't seem to want to do anything with her. Yeah, she's like she's like seaweed in that she just goes with the sort of the tide. Yeah, just yeah. Just kind of drifts backwards and forwards. Um, Dylan returned this year as well. Um, it, very interestingly played by the same actor who played him whenever it was that he was in it last, six, seven, eight, yeah, I don't even know how old this kid is. Um, and he's not had a lot to do, but... And he's been in it again this week, hasn't he? I feel like it'd be rude to give him the award when yeah, they've I not agree. given him a, a fair shake, to be honest. I guess next year when he's, I assume, in it for a longer period, we'll have more Do of an idea. This year? this year, yeah, this year, sorry. Um, Todd, maybe we'll come back to that one. Norris and Frieda, again, that's maybe a, a victim of the story which didn't go quite the way we wanted it to be. I thought Norris was okay. He was he was Norris, wasn't he? He was a busybody. I, I think he, they, he stayed within character. Um, Frida, maybe I was a bit more disappointed by her because I, I do really, really like Frida and I felt that she hid in the background a little bit during this. She she wasn't heavily featured. Out of Ken, Norris, Claudia and Frida, Frida was the one that was, you know, sitting in the background talking to Charles or whatever, she, which is a shame because she, she's, she's a real spunky, spicy character. Yeah, she reminded me of like a long-running sitcom where they have a throwback 
episode and they have like a cameo and they're like, look, look, it's Frida. You liked Frida, didn't you? All right, piss off Frida. Let's get on with the story. Yeah. The thing is, I mean, lots of viewers don't really care about Frida. Out of, out of Claudia, Ken, Norris and her, she's obviously yeah, the most minor of characters. Well, it's a shame that Corey didn't. What I mean. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was nice to see her, but her, her return was a bit rubbish. It was just like, look, it's Frida. Huh? Huh? Mm. Huh? Huh? Anyway. But... Re- what are you going to say about Todd? You said you come back it's, to Todd. It's, it's why are we giving him the award? Because his return... What do you mean giving him the his award? His return was rubbish. But <laughs> out of all the characters who have returned this year, now I look back on the year, I think I'm glad they brought him back the most. And, I, and, and he's the character that I'm most excited about the potential for. Yeah, this is the dilemma here because his return story was crap. His return in general... Brilliant. Mm. Uh, and, and the fact that I was so dead against bringing back <laughs> Todd because of the recast and how can anybody, you know, live up to the, the great character that there was before. Um, and, and I'm not saying I've been proved wrong completely, but I've been very, very, very pleasantly surprised with how much I'm watching Gareth Pierce in the role now and thinking, OK, that's Todd. I'll buy it. I'm not going to moan and nitpick and, and nerd about it that that can be Todd but yeah that that story where he came back with with Mick the gangster which I mean we've, we've already talked at length about earlier on this episode that, uh, that was just poor see I wanted to give this to Natasha because she's been a very sort of like a phantom in her own story but you're right in that Todd's Todd's comeback I can't I don't know how they came up with such a harebrained scheme and such a bad way to introduce. And this Todd character. just wasn't himself, was he? Skulking no. around, gulping, hiding upstairs, Literally coming saying downstairs. The word gulp. Yeah, coming down the stairs every time somebody left before they'd even, you know, close, close the, door. the door. It was just badly written, badly poor, ridiculous, badly just portrayed. Yeah, but he has, as I say, he's come out of it since then. I believe. And I know not everybody well, says that. I think he's, he's really enjoyable to watch now. In that sense, I don't think it'd be too bad to give him this because it's it's not saying that he should not have come back. No. Uh, and we said this, it's not nothing that we haven't said before. So I, I think we should give it to Todd. Okay. I, I felt... The actual I, story I of his return though, was a poor return story. Yeah, I feel as though you couldn't, you genuinely couldn't have written a worse story and still pretended that you were trying to write a good story for yeah, Todd. For, for, it's like for somebody... Todd on the team was trying to sabotage and obviously that's not what happened but I can't see how else they came up yeah. with such a silly idea yeah yeah um okay fine Todd there we go rubbish, so this, rubbish return and we have got a final award now final. And, and it feels like it's not a uh, I mean I know you didn't it, really I, I didn't order these this isn't like and the grand award tonight you should have ordered these this is just the last one on my table that I've got the results it's because normally we lead up to the the bobbins award which is the silliest story award and uh but yeah the I said maybe, maybe it ties in with the fact that this is a bit of a rubbish end to a award show about rubbish nuts in Coronation Street. Oh, but so we're the, just uh, being meta. We at Divid Team certainly meta by making the Weatherfield Wayfarer our final award of the night, which is where we um, poke fun at some characters' long-term disappearance for no particular reason on the show but and these... the reasons that they come up with to explain yeah. why they're not here. These, these are another casualty of COVID. Some, some of, them. of them are, but I... Um, Totally, I, I don't think... You're not going to take responsibility not... for all of them no, to be no. that, are you? Sometimes they just decide that characters aren't going to be in it for a long time. This is the thing that gets me. You don't need to tell us why they're not in it sometimes, Corey. That's like, the thing. You don't need to come up with an idea all the time. Like, some of these, some characters have not been in the show for months on end and we didn't notice because we, you were distracting us with other things. You don't need to say... Oh yeah, Brian and Kathy have gone to Naples for a how for a seminar about how to cut tomatoes, uh, the opposite way to the way they normally cut them, and they won't be back for three months because it's really really complicated. Mm. Like you don't need to say that; just don't have them in the show for three months. So our nominees here, we've got Beth and Daniel going up to Scotland for a bit. Now Beth, um, this was more like De- this was more a case of like a combination of 
the reason they were going and the length of time it took them yeah. so was Dan- not logical. Daniel went up there to Scotland because he wanted to go on a grief retreat. Well, that didn't really do a very good job, did it? Um, and he went away from the sixth <laughs> of March to um, the. Th- I don't know. Like, he went. He went. Yeah, he went away to the to the twenty ninth of April. Or was that Beth? I can't remember. No, no, no listen. This kind of <laughs> months he went like, away. <laughs> I think. No, he, yeah. Listen. You're like moaning about how long it took and he came back and he wasn't over it. Do you think they should have had on the leaflet like like a guarantee? Like, you won't be sad. All your money back. <laughs> no, I'm remembering now. He went away for two months on the show, which, if we just give COVID allowance, was one month away because this is when we had three episodes a week rather than six. But a month away to go to Scotland to get over his dead wife and it didn't really work. That was a bit like, yeah, you didn't, it didn't work. No, but the, uh, that, the to me, that thing, to me is fine. The silliest thing really was Beth deciding to go with him, her mortal enemy, who she felt had betrayed the memory of her dead yeah, niece. Yeah, going on a, tr- a trip to get over her. Yeah. And he, yeah, so he went along to, she went along to try and, you know, get, build, rebuild bridges with him. And this is when Lisa George was doing her dancing on ice, I think. But she not she loved Scotland so much that when he came back at the end of April, she decided to hang on in there. And we next saw her on the street on the third of uh, June. So March, April, May, three months that she was away. Um, I I want to give this. I I think this is a good nominee which because is a month and a half in real time. Because the re the reason being is that, um, yes, she was. I don't. It's, it feels mean to like categorize who should be sadder. <laughs> but generally it's agreed upon that a spouse feels the grief more intensely mm. than uh, than other people might do and he was there not as long as she was well she the thing is, I she think didn't she needed like an extra retreat, did she she, she, she went, went to be there to, to like keep him company yeah. and, and i think like she, like, she needed the extra time to just get over how much she hated Daniel, probably. <laughs> uh, we've also got Jenny and Johnny's sejour to France. So Jenny went away on the 20th of April, and we didn't see her again until the 1st of July. So that's all of May, all of June, a little bit of April. So she was away for two and a bit months, which is really a month. That's a very long time to go away I to France, France to visit Eva when you've got a business back in the UK. <laughs> Johnny, meanwhile, didn't come back until the very end of August. So he, he had May. From Scott. Yeah, he was hiding from Scott. So May, June, July, or four months. Johnny was away. So that's two months, really, with with you know COVID allowance and everything. Um, that's uh, that seemed like a very strange amount of time for him to go away. That story was a victim of COVID, um, but yeah, that that all felt a bit silly when he was refusing to come back. Um, Eileen going to Thailand. Um, she seemed to be there for a jolly long time and then she had to stay around because uh, it wasn't Jason's mate getting COVID tested or something. Um, Liz bocking off to Spain, still not returned, despite the fact that her grandson has um, been diagnosed with mitochondrial disease and, and died, died and had during her absence. Uh, you'd have thought that she might have shown up, but obviously this is there are off-screen reasons why Beverly Callard hasn't been able to return to the show. Uh, and I'm not just talking about I'm a Celebrity. Um, and then we've got a couple of extra long honeymoons um, that could also be nominated. So Sarah and Adam got married on the 4th of March. They weren't seen again until the 6th of May. So they had two month long honeymoon, <laughs> but it's actually one month because of COVID allowance. Still one month honeymoon. Sounds Four. good to me. I bet they needed a relax after that. Gary and Maria went away on the 17th of August and didn't come back until the 2nd of October. And they, And this was all filmed after... The, the, the lockdown as well. So there's no COVID allowance here. That was literally second half of August, all of September. So a month and a half, literally, on honeymoon for Gary and Maria, spending all that loan shark cash. Oh, shit, they had a candlelight dinner, though. Do you remember? She talked yes. about that and he was saying how much it cost him. That was weird. And, and the thing is, for a lot of these as well, that when we next see the characters after the honeymoon, they didn't have to say, oh, look, they're back from their honeymoon. We could have just assumed that maybe they came back after two weeks, like most people have as a honeymoon. But they had to make a point of saying, they're back from their honeymoon. How so now it's been honeymoon? cemented that their honeymoon was an exordinate amount of time. Um, <laughs> this this category just seems to be more your thing than mine, because I'm not really bothered. But you're like, you have a real bee in your bonnet about I do. And, and I think this, this one, this hasn't always been a category in these awards. I think over the, 
maybe it was even last year where we first introduced it, or maybe it was the year before, I can't remember, where it seemed like there were more and more strangely long absences, like Roy goes down to Hastings just to try and check out about his ring, that you, and then he stays there for a month. It's just a bit silly, really. It, it all, to me, is them down to you don't need to tell us Coronation Street why they're away for so long, but yet they often insist on doing so. Yeah. I think out of all of these, really, the, the silliest one to me are these honeymoons, and... and and because it's the longest, I would maybe say Gary and Maria. There was never really an explanation about why they went away for quite so long. Um, I, I don't want to give it to Jenny and Johnny because of, of the COVID victim thing. I think Beth being away was odd, but I don't know whether it was ever established exactly when she came back, maybe. Um, th- there's nothing there that gets my goat quite as much as some of the nominees have done in previous years. I mean, is it... You said this isn't your thing, but is there anything there that particularly Not stands really. out to you? Not really. I think maybe Liz going off to Spain was a bit weird. I don't know. But that's almost like it can't be helped, which is, I don't know whether they should, whether that, we, we can give it to them. <laughs> I, I just, to me, that the, where, where on earth are these characters after they got married did stand out, particularly as, you know, Sarah Ad and Gary Maria have been, you know, relatively important well, characters so yeah, you'd have thought listen, they'd get him back the thing about gary maria and sarah and adam the fact that even they got married in the first place really seems to only be for the story yeah. about you know their dramas and you know well, it's certainly not because they're well suited or they love each other the whole point point of marrying them off to one another was to create more drama in the storyline between all four of them yeah and so then to have those characters not be in the show for months on an, on end because they got married because of the plot just seems like, what what are you doing then? Yeah. I'm going to go to Gary and Maria then if you're not so no, fussed about these. You. Right, and th- that is the end of our awards. Let's just have a little quick recap of who's won. Just oh, as a reminder if you've stuck with us this long. So I think, gosh, I don't even remember. Did we give the do one new one to new summer? You're, all you're doing now is showing us up. I'm not going to recap the results because I've not been <laughs> writing it down. It's really not that important. This is, then, uh, all this is, is just um, a venting know. exercise. Um, and hopefully if you guys had anything that you wanted to vent, we might have covered it in some manner. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots that we didn't. And as the year went on last year, if something utterly ridiculous you know, cropped up, I did write it in. So these awards have been ongoing and I've already started my list for the 2021 Bobbins Awards. How? I've got I don't a couple understand. of things on there already. Um, so, but yeah, there, there must be more that I haven't mentioned. I mean, do do write in and tell us if there are any other ridiculous moments that you want to highlight that we didn't. You don't even have to give them a reward. You can just say that was stupid in 2020. It's, it, it's nice to get it off your chest. I feel, you know, Feel lighter. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've, I've unburdened myself this evening. <laughs> uh, lots of fun. But you know what? We still love Coronation Street, really. Yes, Just we do. Just fun, everybody, even if you're listening winners. and thinking, why are you even doing a podcast about Coronation Street if you hate it this much? Yeah. And I, like I've said this before, don't get offended by other people's opinions. It, who, it doesn't matter. The internet was designed for people to moan and bitch about things yeah. surely that was nobody should take what we say so seriously that they get annoyed about it that's what i keep <laughs> thinking like what what do you think it matters what we think it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't matter really it's just for fun just yeah just for larks just for the lols oh, right. summer would say for excuses sorry that's the end of this no excuses i'm just saying that's the end of it yeah they do write if you in didn't and like tell it us. at least it's over now <laughs> if you would like to yeah make a list of all our faults Go ahead and No, do don't. It. Don't send it to me, though. I don't want to read it. I know. Read it. Yeah. I already know. <laughs> um, th- that's it. Thank you for, for listening, everybody. Do write in, tweet us, Facebook us, see us on YouTube. You might be already listening to this on YouTube. You never know. Um, just <laughs> you might know. Don't forward this on to anybody who works at Coronation Street because they might get sad about it.